Ready? Oh, no, I'm talking about Kateri Johnson. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Ms. Kateri. I need to just call her Ms. Kateri all the time. <laughs> because I know it's, it's confusing. Know. Thank you, though. We are ready. Are ready? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray morning. Beach's regular City Commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, April 6, 2021. This is a virtual meeting. Um, please call the roll. Ms. DeFranco? Present. Ms. Cassell? Here. Mr. Boylston? Present. Ms. Johnson? Present. Mayor Petrolia? And I'm here. Um, please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, moving on to agenda approval. Does anybody have any changes to the agenda? Yes, I do. Okay. All right, let's start with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Commissioner Frank, I'm sorry, Vice, is it Vice, Deputy Vice Mayor Frankel? I'm yeah. Adam. Is that right? <laughs> um, I wanted I'm sorry, to see if there I'm was, confused. I'm Adam, I'm Adam. <laughs> okay, um, I was come on, you, you're, to, you're first. Thank you. I wanted to bring uh, forward uh, a request and obviously to see if there was consensus to move items 7E and 7F to our workshop agenda for next week. Uh, the reason why I bring that forward is there are two discussion items. And I did speak to our city attorney, Ms. Jellin this morning, and she thought it would be more appropriate to have that on the workshop agendas. So I, I, I'll second for, just for discussion. Um, after speaking with staff, I was gonna make a similar recommendation, but I wasn't gonna set for them to be on the workshop. Uh, for 7E, uh, we are in litigation. We have a um, we have a shade meeting set. I, after speaking with staff, it doesn't seem any reason to have that conversation publicly. Um, and in regards to 7F, I think there's obviously, there's a conversation to be had in the future, not one to be had now, because it doesn't seem that uh, there's been any decisions made for us to discuss. I got all the updates from city staff, but sounds like there will be one in uh, somewhere in the near future. I don't, I wouldn't see why we'd even put them on the next workshop. That, that would be fine too. Uh, the other thing, it's my understanding, and if someone has different information, please correct me. I think Highland Beach, their city council, they're discussing that item tonight. So it may be moot for us to even discuss it because they may make the decision one way or the other. But I'd be fine with Mr. Boylston's recommendation. Well, I mean, I um, added that to the agenda because I wanted to make sure that there were, um, that the entire commission was aware of what actually is going on and not be caught um, blindsided by what's happening. Uh, that's the reason why you got all the information. Um, I understand that they're continuing to discuss it, but it does, uh, it is a policy decision by the city of uh, Delray Beach and it, and I think it's worthy of, it doesn't have to be a deep discussion, but it was just worthy of, um, you know, an open discussion about what is actually taking place. And I'm talking about the Highland Beach, uh, the, the 7F discussion. Um, I just thought that it would be important for everybody to understand what's uh, coming down the pipeline instead of getting, uh, you know, caught behind it. I think it's, uh, it, it does involve us and, and it, it, there's a lot of history here that, uh, you know, should be uh, brought into play so that we know what's going on. I, I would rather have that discussion, um, but I'm only one vote. And uh, as to the other, th that was just a, um, you know, uh, an, I, I was, ex I, I, listen, I know that there's been a lot of discussion outside of the city uh, commission and we don't really have all the facts and I understand that there are uh, a lot of, there's a lot of, been a lot of um, discussion about uh, what's actually taken place and it's not necessarily uh, the, the truth or the, the whole truth hasn't come out and I think that with, in the scope of what the, the inspector general's report stated, I just felt like it might be a good idea to hear what um, the explanation so that we can call some of the, uh, you know, um, the rumor mills out there that are, that are um, 
you know, seeming to grab hold and, and, and make, you know, things that aren't, make things look like they're true when they're not. Uh, that, that was just the reason that we had that on there, but we can always move that to the, to the, um, to the agenda for the, for the workshop if that pleases everyone. But I thought that the reason that it was on there, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Ms. Jellen, wasn't it because you wanted it prior to our, our meeting? I, I don't remember why the reason was to be on this meeting, but there was something. Uh, no, but I just, uh, th there wasn't really any, any true um, reason other than we are having a shade meeting next week. This isn't something that can be discussed in the shade. Um, the basis for the lawsuit is not is not relevant to this consideration. So uh, I serve at your pleasure. I, we can do it whenever you want, but I just want to be clear that at the shade meeting, these these reports cannot be discussed. They have to be discussed in right. the sunshine, if at all. Uh, anyone else want to um, speak up? Um, let's let's go to uh, Commissioner Boylston. I believe you. I'm sorry, you had your hand up, and then I, and then I'm going to go to the other two uh, com um, commissioners. Go yeah. right ahead. Like I said, I think these are conversations that we're going to have in the future. I just think they're they're premature, especially after meeting with staff. We all individually have a lot of the information, the reports, the explanation. For those of you that have met with staff, I've met with staff. Um, on all these topics, several several times, several phone calls. So I'm in a, I'm in a good place. I don't think it's necessary to to speak about either of these items, especially because one is in in litigation, and uh, and the other ones we don't know where that's going to go yet. So I'll, I I was going to move it to a date uncertain, and when we need to bring it back up for discussion, we can. Um, uh, let's see here, uh, Vice Mayor, you had your hand up. Yes, I have, Mayor. Thank you very much. I have never in my four years on the commission seen a discussion of an OIG report. So I think uh, after reading it, it's, um, dare I say, I'm very liking in all kinds of information that uh, aren't there. And I understand according to Ms. I'm correct, Ms. Jellen, we were supposed to have, if we were going to discuss it, we were going to have the OIG, Mr. Carrie, come and talk with us, but he's unavailable, so why are we talking about it? So I am not in favor of having uh, 7E discussed in the public uh, at this particular moment, time rather. And as far as 7F, it might not hurt the commissioners in Highland Beach to hear what some of our thoughts are, if we have any. Um, this might also be something we should wait until they've made their decision and then we can make our decision. So I'm in favor of both of those being tabled, removed from this agenda. Commissioner Cassell. Thanks. I wouldn't mind moving 7F because I agree um, with uh, Mr. Frankel that, and, and Mr. Boylston that there's, it, there's ample time to discuss this in the future and we don't know where it is, but with respect to the um, OIG report, my concerns are transparency for the public. And I'm also, as the newest, well, you know, because you are, were reelected, Commissioner, there's some information on this, historic information that I would like to get in the group format. But more important, this discussion is out there in the public. Um, and we all know that. So I believe the public has a right to know what's in that report. And I think we should put it out there. I think we need to work on our transparency. That's the one thing I, I believe we learned recently. And I believe the public has a right to know what that report says. And then they can, we can engage in discussion after that. I know we're in litigation, but I'm certain our attorney would not offer to put out discussion on this report or make a presentation on this report if it would affect us. So I would like to hear that. And I think the residents would as well. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, Vice Mayor. Yes, um, just because something is out in the public, rumors, non-rumors, whatever they are, does not mean that the city commission should take the initiative to discuss it. I think this is, in my opinion, very one-sided. There are a lot of missing elements. And if we're not gonna be presented with the entire picture, which I think would take more than a couple of, even a half an hour discussion, so this is not something you necessarily want to have out. And we've never discussed an OIG report, to my uh, knowledge. Am I correct, Mayor? I 
listen, that's a good question. I know that we have had um, uh, OIG uh, reports discussed before, but I, it's been a while. I don't think anybody that's sitting on this commission with maybe one exception um, would have been involved in that. We haven't had a lot of them come out, but um, we have had them discussed in the past. We've actually had uh, Mr. Carey and, it, and his predecessor one time come out, um, but um, that was more of a general discussion. So I'm not sure that Mr. Carey is uh, interested in discussing this specifically. And that's, I think, that one of the reasons why uh, Ms. Jellen was going to discuss it. I don't have a problem with it, but the, pro the, the, the issue that I have is that when we don't, when we're not transparent with what, uh, you know, has been put out there and we don't have somebody explaining what the differences are between reports or whatever, you know, it, it, it does grow legs and it does make for um, rumors that may or may not be based in truth. And what I'm trying to do is, and I would like to see is us just, you know, um, hear from those that, that have the, it, it, you know, they, they, that are involved in this, that know what took place. Because I have both two different, you know, scenarios being played out that I've been told on, on different um, pallets. And I think it's very important to try to get to the truth uh, of the matter. Um, that's just how I feel about it, because otherwise we're, we're, we're uh, you know, I, I just feel like it's, 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 it's a darkness that's not good. And because we've got a, it, it feels like it's a black eye for me, you know, this, this whole situation that takes place. May I also inject that there is only one report, and from what I understand, that there is more than one. So why is, if you're going to discuss it, why is only one report there? So. I'm, I'm not in favor. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just uh, on that. I, 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 both of these conversations are going to be had, and I get that there's pressure from from the public. But we've been really patient with these reports coming out. Um, the other, the other, you know, last report was only finished a few weeks ago. We have a shade meeting coming up, which is a separate subject, and then we have, then it's going to be heard whether or not that that lawsuit's going to move forward. I would rather until the whole story is all wrapped up and we know where we are in position of a city before we have a full conversation about all of these reports and about these 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 two associates. Um, I'm not going to let Facebook post push me into having a premature conversation. We will have this conversation in the future. Until then, these documents are public record. Yeah, I don't. It's not Facebook uh, conversations that I've I've heard from. I've heard from actual people that 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 are concerned. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner Cassell? Yeah, and I just want to add that this isn't about Facebook. There are reputable people in our community writing about this. And I question whether they have all the information. And I, I agree with you. It's about transparency and letting people know. And I, Ms. Johnson, I'm with you. If, if somebody wants to present both reports, then people can see the predicament that we're in. I mean, that's I'm totally amenable to that, but not sharing information and allowing substantial amount of time to go on concerns me because people will speculate and we're not explaining anything. That's just my position. I think that there's already a majority that does not want to um, have the discussion for sure on the um, 7E. So I think that that's going to be stricken from the um, agenda. And then, um, as far as 7F, um, I think it's I think it's uh, short-sighted for us not to have the conversation about this because our um, this this has to do with uh, what we are going to determine is the type of service that we are going to provide for Highland Beach. I don't think it's up to Highland Beach to determine that, and I think it's a conversation that we should be having um, so that we can be on record as to what we are. Um, uh, you know, wanting to have, but listen, I am one vote, and uh, if that's not the uh, the will of the uh, majority, then we will strike that one as well. So um, let's go back to. Uh, did anybody else want to speak to this? Are we are we good? Okay. So who is uh, in favor of removing that? Just raise your hand by gonna, hand. Are, are we going to vote, Mayor? Or I well, think I the cleanest way would be to vote on it. No. Well, we're going to vote on an, a, a changed agenda. So I just need to see if we're going to be, that's going to be part of the, you know, the agenda of the um, amended agenda. So who is, and I see two hands. Are you um, interested, uh, uh, Ms. Casal, in removing that or not? You said no, right? 
I can't hear you. We're on to the fire. Yes. I wouldn't mind hearing about it. If it has to be at another date, I'm amenable to that. But I agree. I mean, the discussion needs to be had. Okay. And so, and Ms. Okay. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor, you you said the same. Yes. Do you want to? I, I, I'm, I'm, we're going to have that discussion, but I would like to at least see where the Highland Beach uh, Town Council is, what they're going to say. We don't know. So maybe we're being premature until they've indicated that there's a problem, then we have a contract. Okay. And so um, the, um, I know that we will know by the workshop meeting, is it, is it, a, acceptable to put it on the workshop meeting coming up next week? We should know. So, Mayor, are we having a workshop or just a shade meeting? I think we have a workshop. I thought it was on, just on a shade the meeting. Front. Hold on. Let me ju just it's, check it's for you. Hold on. Now no, we have a workshop. Workshop and the shade meeting precedes it? Yes. Yeah, the, work, the workshop follows the shade meeting. Okay. Fine. Next you week want to put fine. it on that? Okay. Next week All right, will so be we'll fine with me. All right, so we're going to move um, 7F to the, the workshop, and then we are going to remove completely 7E. Um, anything else uh, as far as changes on the agenda? Yes, ma'am, uh, Vice to Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on, Vice Mayor? Okay, you, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. There you go. I would like to have a, a brief discussion about 6.C. Dot dot. Okay. Hold on just a minute, we'll get into it. Okay. All right, so 6C is the interlocal agreement with the prevention of the um, coalition's Learn to Swim program. We'll make that 7AA if that's okay with everyone. Yep. And, and I would else? also like, I would also like to discuss 6.G. Okay, 6G is the um, Educational Service Foundation, um, the uh, Law Enforcement Trust Fund, $5,000. We'll make that yes. 7BB. Okay. Um, Ms. Cassell? That is all for me. That is all for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it possible to ask a question without pulling something from the consent agenda? I just was wondering on 6K1 if the chief could tell us if this piece of equipment would be for Highland Beach or if that was for us uh, in light of our discussion that we were going to have this evening. Or perhaps I without it. Let's... Okay, 6K1. All right, let's just pull it very quickly and do 7CC and then we'll get that answer to you, okay? Thank you so much. You got it. All right. Anything else? Chief, uh, Chief Tommy, I, I see your hand up. Thanks. If somebody can recognize uh, Chief Tommy. I'm not hearing Yes, ma'am. I was just going to answer that oh, from Ms. Cassell. It's special ops truck is for Delray Beach. Thank Perfect. you. So don't pull 6K1 from the consent then. Got it. So we're moving 7CC. All right. Anything Thank else? You. Looks like not uh, entertain a motion with the changes. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Second. Okay. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. All right, we're moving on to comments and inquiries, starting with the city manager's response to prior, prior public comments or inquiries. Do you have anything? I don't have anything at this moment, Mayor. All right, moving on to the public. Um, this would be Ms. Kateri Johnson. Do we have anything recorded? Yes, we do. We do. All right. Hi, this is Gail Clark. 
124 Northeast 7th Avenue, Delray Beach. I have been sworn in. I'm calling to protest the action a little late, I might add, but what happened at the Sunday property with the clandestine removal of the final uh, 80 or so trees last week. Uh, I'm heartbroken that this happened. If I recall, May 18th, 2018, there was a final reading on the approval of that property. Um, you know, actually, there was an unanimous vote, I believe, by the commission at that time, approving the property, uh, but noting that 80 or so trees would still remain on the property, either remain, be relocated, saved, protected. Uh, these are the trees, it appears, that were removed last week, trees that were irreplaceable, trees that have been there for upwards of 100 years, the baboa tree, the leeches, the mangoes, live oaks. Um, someone like Claudia Willis would probably be more uh, changed as to what the trees were, but they had been carefully planted and tended by a generation of people who had forest heights for our city and for the historic value. And developers are now coming in. They, um, I know Peb Capital is who did this. I heard that they had did not have permission for this removal, that these developers have made contributions and paying funds and therefore for sitting commissioners and therefore somehow feel that this is okay for them to do. The punishment needs to be swift and more than a slap on the wrist, more than a $250,000 fine. Anything short of criminal would be fine with me. They need $50,000 a tree, something that makes them sit up and notice. And PEP needs to be made an example of because this will continue. We are not safe, period. There was a couple over there crying. They have been taking pictures here for years. And it's, it's heartbreaking what is happening to our city, things that cannot ever be replaced, trees, natural habitats, beautiful areas to build these horrible buildings. And who's going to be here? Who's going to come? We can't, um, we can't let this continue to happen. It's, it's really horrifying. Everything we have is vulnerable and at risk because developers somehow have the feeling that they can get away with murder here, and they do. I'm wondering how this happened, and I want to know what's going to be done about it. I want the commissioners that have been elected to prove that they actually care about Delray Beach, and I thank you. Yes, hi. My name is Rita Brana, and I'm at 50 East Road in beautiful Delray Beach. I would like to speak regarding um, our historic properties and how they're being treated. I think that it's important to understand um, that the, the structures, it's not just about the historic structure itself. It's what not only that it represents, it also gives some opportunity for some quiet spaces. Um, think about some of the places that as you drive by or walk by, you feel the best about in Delray Beach. And I'm going to guess that a place like Old School Square is included in that. And it's because it presents a little bit of a quiet space. There's less pollution in those spaces. There's more trees and greenery in those spaces. Um, and as representatives, as you, the commissioner and mayor, are representatives for the residents, um, whether you agree or not agree with that particular structure, your responsibility is to thread together the, the various desires and compromise with the residents. Um, and so, therefore, these structures have a matter of importance. And it's getting a little tiring that we continue to disregard them and, and permit developers to let them get to a point where they're just about falling apart. There should be a listing of our historic areas 
and a solidification by the commission of the historic properties that they support. And then we should do just that. We should support them and really understand the importance of not only those structures and what they represent and how you feel as you pass them, but the quiet spaces, the less pollution, and the, the, the open and the, the greenery and the fact that that adds value to a city. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Carolyn Patton, 1020 Tamarind Road, Delray Beach, Florida. I've been working in historic preservation in Delray Beach for the last 30 years. And as part of that, I served on a city commission task team on historic preservation, where we worked with the city attorney to strengthen the demolition by neglect ordinances in Delray Beach. Now, when I look at South Swinton, the first block of on the west side of Swinton, I, where some of the most iconic historic structures are in our town, I'm very, very concerned. I don't think they're being the historic ordinances are being enforced there. And I would like to suggest at this time, I think it's gone beyond code enforcement. I think the city commission should ask Teb Enterprises to allow a city inspection to make sure these historic buildings are being maintained because they're going to move them twice and move them once, then move them back to their original, almost to their original historic places. I beg you to do this for this very important historic area. Thank you. Hello, my name is Claudia Willis. I live at 160 Marine Way. And I'm calling about section 4.6.19, our tree preservation ordinance. While it is lofty in its goal, <laughs> to um, save our dwindling canopy, it is not working and must be amended to achieve the intent. I live in the Marine Historic District, specifically the former blank nurseries, but have witnessed the removal of old growth trees for which we were famous. In the last two months alone, I've witnessed major shade trees removed on Palm Square as well as a builder ripped the do not demo tapes off of trees that I know according to the plans were to be relocated or saved. And he proceeded to have them demolished. A true low and complete insult to what the ordinance stands for was the approval to remove the number and species of trees on the Sunday project. The developer Additionally, indiscriminately removed trees, disregarding the approved landscape plans. We must stop, stop having a buyout plan for developers. There are cities that require you to build around trees. Until we have rules in place and commissioners who say no, we will continue to turn the blind eye on the whole intent of the preservation of our existing canopy. How much do we need to lose before we can say no? Replacement of 30 and 40 year old trees cannot be done with saplings. This ordinance is not working. It is in your hands to strengthen it and enforce it for our future. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Victoria Boone, address 507, South Oak 15th Avenue, Delray Beach, Florida. I'm kind of concerned um, how Delray's charm is being taken away, the history. We have the Sunday House, which is a village uh, that is now looking like a decrepit area. Nothing is upkept. And we have certain areas that we've actually fell short on, like the sea grapes. We allowed them to be cut back, but now we see them cut down. We had good restaurants that were more 
own feeling like Blue Anchor. And now more ones that are coming in are more upscale, high end. We don't have that feel of the village by the sea. So, so we can't allow you to that the destruction of our historical buildings. Like the Sunday Village, like go without holding you responsible for the loss of Delray's charm and history. Allowing another developer to create a situation of demolition by neglect is on your watch. You must ensure the development services and code enforcement to do their job, or there will be nothing left for the future generations here to know what Delray Village by the Sea really feel and look like. Thank you for your time and your effort of listening to my concerns. My name is Benita Goldstein, 302 Northeast 7th Avenue, and I'm calling in to comment on the subject of the desecration of the land and historic buildings that are located on the Sunday Village property. First off, I'm citing the illegal demolition of the Paul Rudolph House on Seabreeze, where a locally designated historic home was destroyed against our LDRs and codes. How can this happen? The answer is simple. Our city of Delray Beach, with its development services operation, no longer adheres to its own planning and zoning guidelines, along with code enforcement's negligence in enforcing those who have transgressed the regulations. Looking at the Sunday Village project put forth by Ped Capital is a perfect example of further neglect happening within a couple of blocks of these same city offices mentioned above. Yet no one has noticed the barren land upon which a number of historic structures are disintegrating before our very eyes. The history of this very town is on the brink of being vanquished by a developer who has not been held accountable by the very city offices that are supposed to ensure everyone follows the rules. There is the once enchanting Yachi Tea House located in the historic old rectory, which has not been able to reopen and we don't know why? All you have to do is look at these once beautiful historic buildings to know that the concept of demolition by neglect is at work here and wonder how code enforcement has not inspected the numerous buildings on the site given the abominable situation that exists. We can only surmise the city commission must determine how to implement policies that are followed while at the same time enacting strict guidelines that address the consequences when city offices and officials do not adhere to these regulations. The history of Delray lies in your hands, without which we lose the very identity that has made Delray Beach the place it is today. Thank you. Yes, I have been sworn in. My name is Dwight Tidwell. Uh, my address is 252 Northeast 17th Street here in Delray. And I am commenting on the uh, Delray Ridge development, um, the decision to approve a uh, pedestrian path versus a road extension. I have spoken with uh, many of my neighbors, and we are all in support of the uh, path, the pedestrian path, versus the road extension. Having met Ron and some of his team, um, I think their vision for uh, this really unique piece of property is a perfect fit. So thank you very much. My name is David Hopple, manager of DIP Supply, 1700 Southwest 57 Avenue, Miami, Florida, 33155. The comment. This is my second request by DIP Supply to Commission LLC for payment 
due from Rickman construction for work on Southwest 46th Street, Southwest 7th Avenue, Southwest 3rd Court neighborhood improvement contract. Rickman construction owes DIP $38,561.43 and has not been paid. If Dale Ray hasn't received benefits and has not paid Rickman construction for them, that can be called enrichment. If Delray has paid Rickman Construction and received and accepted lien releases that all subcontractors have been paid that have been paid to date from Rickman Construction. That could be called fraud. This is the second request by DIP to the City Commission for payment, which was due on 9-18-20. When I called uh, Aaron at Goodman Baxter, he told me Rickman Construction was claiming there was a dispute with. DIP, reference payment due. To date, DIP has not received any written document outlining this dispute. DIP is asking Delray to help us get payments from Rickman Construction. Thank you. David Hopp, manager. Yes, uh, I had called in about 10 days ago when you were supposed to have the meeting uh, I believe it was on the 19th, I don't remember the date. Anyways, my name is Merrilee Nestler, N-E-S-T-L-E-R, 7340 Amberley Lane, apartment 309, Delray Beach, Florida, 33446. I was calling in reference to the Delray Affair, which was canceled and is now called the Affair of the Arts. I left a long message and I presume you will be getting it, even though it was about 10 days ago. But I just spoke to Cheryl from Festival Management, and I explained to her that I thought we, that I should be getting my money back because I did not pay for the art, um, the affair of the arts, and it, it's being held in um, Boynton Beach at the Boynton Beach Mall. Uh, you. After you listen to my message, uh, she basically stated that uh, she had nothing to do with it because she's part of Festival Management Group and that the person who makes all the decisions is a Stephanie Immelman. And I just wanted to add that to my uh, message that I left about 10 days ago. I appreciate anything you can do in reference to this issue that's being held on April 9th to the 11th because it's very very unfair and what they have done thank you mayor that concludes public comment thank you very much Ms. kateri okay so i see a hand up julie uh Cassell, did you have your hand up or inadvertently left it up I have my hand up um, regarding these trees and, um, you know, we've, I'm, I'm sure we've all had discussions and been getting calls. I understand that trees were removed that were to be uh, relocated. I understand this is going in front of a magistrate, but I was hoping someone could tell us what will that result in potentially and can the city commission um, implement their own fine or penalty at this point in time, because I really think this is remarkably egregious, uh, especially in light of all the information we have with respect to people coming in, requesting um, potentially to do this, being told no, and then leaving and uh, doing it anyway. Um, that's my understanding. And um, and I agree with what Ms. Claudia Lewis said. You cannot replace 30 and 40 year old trees so I'm wondering, putting the magistrate aside and asking uh, Attorney Jellen, what what kind of penalty are they looking at? And then what can we do? Can we impose our own penalty? Do we need to revisit the codes? I agree that um, I know people that have complained about those houses and they're not being addressed. And then second, I think maybe it's time for us to start talking about um, a tree overlay on Swinton and perhaps home trail as well and other areas where we need to preserve and protect our trees. Thank you. Did you want to speak to that, Lynn? Well, can I just say that 
can we follow the agenda and have that i want i want to discuss all of this big time tonight but at the proper moment at the end we have an update from our city manager our city attorney which i'm sure they're going to address this and if not we have our own comments you know this is happening too often now where we're having these conversations out of place in our agenda and there are there are people waiting there are people here at city hall that have agenda items um so if it's okay i would like to stick with our agenda and have this conversation at the proper time we can uh we can discuss it at the end of the the meeting if you want to i don't know if lynn did you want to um mention anything or are you okay to just go ahead and discuss this at the uh during comments I can wait. Okay, and the same thing with you, Vice Mayor? Yes, that was gonna be my comment. I think we need to continue our order, our yep. regular order, and that would be at comment time for everyone. Sure. If it's not on the agenda, we shouldn't go off into a discussion. Okay, and uh, so at comment time, we'll, we'll discuss the trees. Um, hold on just a minute. Okay, so we're moving on then, uh, since we, and, and Commissioner Boylston, you still have your hand up. I presume that's just inadvertent. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, the regular agenda. We've moved uh, item 6C uh, to 7AA, and this is the interlocal agreement with the Palm Beach County Drowning Prevention Coalition. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, and move out, uh, and talk about that. And I think that, uh, Vice Mayor, you brought that up. Mayor, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt. Well, I, I think yes. we need to approve the consent agenda first, and then we can oh, go. I'm sorry, yes, you're right. I did, I did miss that. Please, uh, somebody would mind uh, making a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Motion to approve the consent agenda. As amended. As amended. As amended. As amended. <laughs> okay, thank you. We got a lot of seconds and a lot of motions. Um, call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Okay, so back to uh, 7AA, which was 6C on the consent agenda interlocal agreement uh, for Palm Beach County Drowning and Prevention Coalition. Vice Mayor, you brought this uh, to the uh, forefront. Can't hear you, Vice Mayor. I apologize, I'm mute, I'm mute, sorry. Um, I wanted to discuss not only this program that we're so blessed to have, but to maybe in the near future discuss a summer program for our students, our children. Uh, somehow or another, we, we only appear to have one swimming pool where we have a multiplicity of different programs and occupations of people utilizing the pool and our children are going wanting because there's a program that if you're not in, I guess the, um, the daycare type program wherein the students, I hope, are being given swim lessons. If our neighborhood children, neighborhood being throughout the city, want to use the pool, it's almost impossible. And I also would like to discuss the amount of um, the fees rather, the, uh, I think it's about $2 I've been told, I don't know. I think that's a little uh, steep for a lot of families, especially in this COVID uh, situation. If we're going to have our pool open, it should be that those who aren't able to get into the pool somehow have some um, dispensation allowed that they can also utilize the pool. $2 if you have three or four kids and you're struggling with COVID and everything else that's out there might be a little steep and our children are missing out. Basically, that's all I wanted to do was talk about that. Commissioner Cassell? Well, I wanted to say thank you. And a, a few months ago, I asked uh, for the $2 rate to be reduced. I know there's a necessity to have a fee, but I'm in agreement with you. Um, $2 is a little steep, especially if people have multiple children to go to the pool for a day. So I, I agree with you, we should reduce that down. Thank you. 
Okay, and um, I wanted to add to um, this conversation on a different level. Um, this has to do with the actual prevention um, uh, SWIM program. Uh, when I looked at the backup in this, there was um, no enrollment on in 2019. Uh, it was closed for 2020 due to COVID. Before that, 18 was 109, and then before that in 17, it was 240. So we have slowly dwindled down to almost, well, to a no enrollment in 2019. And I'm asking um, the city to, uh, uh, why, why that's the case. What, what happened between 17 and 19 that we actually had nobody enrolled in the program? Uh, Sam, you have your um, hand up. I'm recognizing you if, you can, if we can get somebody to allow him to uh, have access to speak. Yes, hello everyone, Mayor, Commissioners, yeah. Sam Mita, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to echo um, Vice Mayor Johnson's comment about this being a great program. Um, what this is, is a voucher program that allows for individuals to learn to swim and get reimbursed um, by the county so that it's free to the participant, but yet we still make a revenue stream through this. And that's what you see in the backup. Um, to first talk about the coalition portion, um, we didn't. We did try to uh, get this in, up and running. Unfortunately, we didn't get enrollment in time at the end of 2020, as you know. Uh, we brought this around the end of August, I believe, to commission for approval um, by a time of a sign. We just didn't get anybody involved in the late notice. But we were one of the first to the county to get back to this program post-COVID. In 2019, uh, there just wasn't enrollment, and it's something that we wanted to try in 2022 improve on and get a bigger um, advertising push and so on in the community and get it back up to where it used to be. 2017 was our best year by far, as you can see. Prior to that, we were averaging around 50 or 60 participants um, in the program throughout the year. So we actually had an, an amazing 2017 and 18, which um, were our best numbers ever, but we were averaging about six, 50 or 60 participants for the years prior to that. So it's something we want to push and we are actively trying to do so, which is why we were so eager to get it up and running in 2020. And I believe this program now does it for multiple years. So it's something that we can really um, push to our community and get everybody back into the pool and learning to swim because we know how important it is for everybody at a young age to learn to swim here in Florida. Um, so what, what was the difference between, how, how did we get so many people in one year and then not, and ha less than half of that in the following year? I'm just curious, did we do advertising in 2017 or how did we, how did we make that reach as many, uh, a number of participants as, as, as came through that year? Do you know? I don't know why we did so well in 2017, but I'm, you know, it's one of the things I'll work with staff about and say, what were we doing that was so su successful? Um, and then on top of that, increasing our social media presence and getting that word out um, to our, our campers as well. All right, great. Um, and um, can, do, what do you, how much do we receive um, for these $2 entrance fees to the pool? What is our, our revenue stream on that? Uh, it averages somewhere between four to $5,000 a year. Okay. All right, is there, um, so we would be looking at maybe half of that if we decided to lower the price to a dollar getting in. Correct, and that, that's something I would like to just mention is that I believe this was free talking to staff many years ago, and it was actually a suggestion from staff at some point to make it a nominal fee because there was um, a lot of people in the community just coming to the pool as a hangout place and weren't even getting in the pool. So they wanted to make it where there was a reason you were going um to participate and they kept it very low but but again a dollar or two dollars i think is something you okay can and then um do we know what the seacrest pool charges for their entrance just out of, as a comparison i don't i do not know the seacrest chart all right very good um vice mayor yes thank you mayor i would say that the majority of the people uh, participants in the Northwest Southwest are not going to go to the Seacrest pool. Just saying a no. lot of them don't have participation no. with the, with the students. I'm sorry, with the um, neighborhood, they don't have transportation. So I also would like Mr. Metock 
once he talked to the staff to try and understand, is it because the pool isn't available? Because we have so many other programs going on. We know that it's used by our firemen for their uh, swim program. Um, because again, I don't know if a lot of people even know about the other pool. Everyone seems to use it. And when it's available to the children, are we having our after school or summer program that would exclude the neighborhood children from being in the pool because there's a restriction. If you're not with our program, you're not permitted in the pool. So I, I think that's an, probably some of the answers to your question there. Um, we just have restricted it to the point where it's not available to the community. Got it. Yeah. And I wasn't suggesting that anybody would be going over to Seacrest. I just wanted a, a comparison as to what they charged also just to find out if we're way outside of the line or if it's not. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not, it's three you know. fifty. I was, I was going to say for adults and three dollars for children. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. So um, is there any other concerns? Uh, Commissioner Boston, did, was that just what you were adding? Okay. Got it. Um, Mr. Uh, Mitat, you have something more to, to add? No, I was just going to follow up with that number as well. All right, sounds good. So do you want a decision or a, um, does, does the city want a, um, a, I mean, I know we're, we're talking about two different things. We're the, the, what we're actually talking about here is, is, is nothing to do with the entrance of the pools, but it's something I think that we, we need to probably discuss or have on the agenda to change if that's the, the you know the kind of the what the what the commission wants to do but as far as the interlocal agreement was there anything else that need to be said about the interlocal agreement before we move on no ma'am no okay. it's just a right, so make a motion, motion to approve thank you second second all the roll miss johnson yes mayor petrolia yes Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Okay, moving on to um, 7G, which we move to um, 7BB. This is the approval of the request fund for the Delta Cultural Education and Service Foundation. And again, this was pulled by um, uh, Vice Mayor uh, uh, Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I didn't um, have any objection to this, but I would just like to bring it to everyone's attention that there was a formal, uh, this funding dispensation or, or is it dispensation of it? Mm -hmm. The funds were held up because there was no proper um, standard application fulfilling the requirements that um, went along with the funding. And this is going to be something I'll be discussing once we have our meeting next week. Just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention to please pay attention to it. That okay. was all. Very good. Anything else? Seeing nothing? No. Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. All right, moving on to 7A, resolution um, 06-21. Anthea? Oh, you know what? We have, uh, this is, uh, yes, go right ahead. No, this is quasi-judicial. I was going to ask yeah, you to read it. Yeah, I'm going to read it in. You got it. I'm going to read into the, um, uh, to the, um, record uh quasi judicial we've got quite a few of them on there here so it's seven a b c are all quasi judicial um hearings here we go quasi judicial hearing this hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi judicial rules the applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case the public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are pre present but agree not to speak the city commission and the staff and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant may, will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application 
or appeal may not be legally made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens you support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the required law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. Uh, we need to swear in witnesses and um, uh, dis discuss that ex parte disclosure. So let's go to the ex parte. Um, start with the vice mayor. This is re in regards to, I believe, the ra is this the racetrack? Yes, okay, so that's the easy way to remember it. So, um, uh, vice mayor, did you have any ex parte communications that you need to um, disclose? Yes, I do, uh, Mayor. I spoke with the representing attorney, Mr. Weiner, and uh, if whatever's on the on the web on the uh, server. Sorry. Thank you, Vice Mayor, or Deputy Vice Mayor. I'm sorry. Yes, I spoke to Michael Weiner. I spoke to Neil Schiller. I spoke to Christina Morrison. I spoke to our city attorney, and there was an email on this subject by a Scott Friedman that's located on the city server. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cassell. Yes, um, thank you. I spoke to Mr. Weiner, also Mr. Schiller, and I received an uh, email on the server as well. Okay, and Commissioner Boylston? Mr. Weiner, Mr. Schiller, and then what's on the, uh, on the, city, on the city server. I did also get a text message from, from a resident, Christina Morrison. Okay, and um, I did not speak with anybody with the exception of, I think that it might have just been a brief speaking, not really into any detail, I think, with Mr. Weiner um, and Mr. Schiller, but it was a while ago, so not recently. And anything else is on, on the server. Okay, so um, if we can do a swearing Mayor. in. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, um, Mayor. Vice Mayor? Yes, I, okay. I, I'd like to amend my expertise. I did receive a text message from uh, Christina Morrison. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, there's a swearing in. Okay. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, so at this point, we're going to turn it over to city staff to enter the project file into the record, and then the applicant will have their opportunity to be able to um, present. Good evening, Anthea Juniata, Development Services Director. For the record, I would like to enter file 2020-271 use TVB and file 2020-272 WAI, which is for waivers, into the record. Um, there are two resolutions before you. They need to have separate actions and they have separate findings. The first is a conditional use to allow gasoline station at 10 South Congress Avenue, and the other is a waiver um, to the land development regulations to allow a reduction in the minimum floor area required for a freestanding structure. Um, the applicant is here for a presentation. So I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Weiner. Are you there? We're in the room alone. I'm. Um, can you hear me or am I still on mute? Oh, you're here. I didn't realize you were coming in. Okay. Um, can you see your presentation on the screen or do you uh, I do believe I can. Am I unmuted? Okay. You, you are, sir. Thank yes. Okay. Um, if you could just give me a moment to get familiar with the controls. Let me just see if I'm All moving right. forward. I'm going to uh, stop sharing and we're going to send it over to the podium if IT can hear me so that Mr. Weiner can control his slides. No. I may have to do them for you, I think. Let's do that. Is planning okay. and zoning can director, this? that would be fine if you'd be kind enough to tap okay. the button. You've got it. Can you see it, sir? I can see it. All righty. I await your commands. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you tonight for the opportunity to present to you this request for a conditional use and waiver for the property located at, south, at the southwest corner of Atlantic Avenue and Congress Avenue. The use being requested is pursuant to LDR section 4.4.9 and is one of the conditional uses allowed in this zoning district. The proposed project is best classified under LDR section 4.3.3 as a convenience mark with fueling options and food sales. There is no automotive repair. 
The project meets the parking requirements for this use, as staff will further explain. In fact, the shopping center has excess parking in accordance with the code. Uh, a site plan has been reviewed, and by way of information, the only requested waiver is the one waiver you're considering, um, and that is for a decrease, not an increase in the size of the building. And that's being asked because the operator would like to have a COVID-friendly outdoor eating area. And so it's reduced to approximately 5,600 square feet from 6,000. You have a minimum size to your buildings. So it's not to put more on, it's to put less on the property. The issue at hand is also the examination of this particular use for this particular location. So to begin with, the staff agrees with the applicant. We agree that all standards are met. You know all of the standards that have to be um, listed with respect to conditional uses. The proposed racetrack with a convenience store meets the criteria set forth in the LDRs. So with that introduction, let me familiarize you with uh, the area. So if you would, please. Anthea, ready, hit the button. Um, this is a view of the intersection. You're looking directly from the project out into the intersection. Uh, as you know, it's presently a Walgreens. It's a building of approximately 13,000 square feet. I'll detail it for you further. Um, the latest Palm Beach County traffic generation numbers show this to be an a, uh, intersection with more than 40,000 daily trips. So this is a major intersection. This is an out parcel. Um, to pause for a moment, and uh, as will be explained by staff, even though it's at 40,000 uh, trips per day, concurrency is met. There is no traffic issue associated with this particular redevelopment. Remember, it's a 13,000 square foot Walgreens right now. Uh, so let me walk you around the intersection. Uh, if you would, Anthea, next slide. So we have some retail use at the Northwest corner. Uh, it's a pizzeria, uh, home improvement store. Uh, once again, Anthea, thank you. Uh, this is the northeast corner. It's presently an operating gasoline station. Uh, it's approximately one acre, but it also includes a freestanding car wash uh, that's behind it. Uh, uh, next slide, Anthea. Um, built in the 1980s, uh, as you would expect, outdoor bathrooms. Everybody knows the key fob. Um, that's this particular Chevron. Uh, next, Anthea. The southeast corner is an additional gas station. This one's on six tenths of an acre. That's 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 pretty small. Uh, if you would next slide, Anthea. A as you can see, it's it's led to some uses of of outdoor storage. Things aren't placed right. Uh, uh, some garbage situations. Um, it, it's it's cramped to say the least. So let's compare. Our project site is on 1.6 acres. It's replacing a 13,000 square foot store. We're only 5,600. Uh, 50%, the, the site we're on is 50% larger than the Chevron. It's more than twice the size of this shell that you're looking at. It's accommodating a completely different experience. It's allowing for a proper and efficient delivery of its products and food services at a much greater distance from the street as compared to these other gasoline stations. Um, if we might, the next slide, please. Uh, while it's not a requirement under the LDRs, I thought you might be interested on in the loss of the um, full service drug stores. This is a picture of the new CVS and the refurbished Walgreens, of course, brought up to the new standards, as would Racetrack have these new standards. That's at the corner of Military Trail in Atlantic. That's where they moved. That's where they prefer to be. It's near a major grocery store. Um, I'll walk you around the presently existing uh, Walgreens now. So uh, this is the back of the Walgreens. And the next slide, please. And there's the front of the Walgreens and the sides of the Walgreens. Uh, of course, an uninteresting structure, flat roof. Um, this particular structure was built in 1999. It has a drive through. As I've said, it's two and a half times larger than the racetrack. Um, the drive through utilized a great portion of the property. Racetrack does not have drive throughs, obviously. Atlantic Avenue from I-95 to Military Trail, where those drugstores are, um, is a major commercial corridor. It offers basic but necessary products and services for the local residents. Please, the next slide, Anthea. So here's some existing right away. 
In the background there is the only other existing convenience store that's on this uh, particular uh, uh, portion of uh, Atlantic Avenue. Uh, next slide. As the gasoline stations showed you, well, this convenience store has had no capital improvements, probably not since before the turn of the century. Um, there are no service or products in this area uh, uh, that are being delivered in a modern method. In, in fact, everything shows a sign of obsolescence and demonstrate a lack of any appreciable investment in the area. Uh, next slide. So if you take a look along the remainder of the corridor, yes, uh, some banks such as SunTrust. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, automotive repair uh, along this portion, again, uh, built in the uh, 80s. So automotive uses uh, uh, abound. Um, next slide, if you would. Um, for example, the Goodyear, also uh, an older building. Um, Racetrack, the operator of this particular location, will be changing the dynamics completely. And it, it'll be setting a whole new tone because there just hasn't been an investment in this area, uh, as I say, for almost 30 years. As stated, they'll have a COVID-friendly outdoor seating and self-checkout lanes. In fact, please, the next slide, it'll show some of the things that we'll be offering. Besides that, we'll have competitively priced fuel, fresh fruits, prepared salads, breakfast sandwiches, coffee, frozen yogurt, and ice cream. I don't think you saw that in any of the other locations. Well-lit, well-maintained customer areas, including bathrooms, uh, free drinks and coffee to law enforcement, over 20 cameras in and around the building for safety and security, enough room for proper storage and garbage uh, disposal. In comparison to the cramped and tired alternatives along the corridor, Racetrack will be able to provide a safer and more convenient experience with proper circulation and upgraded quality. The project itself will be patterned after the prototypical stores, uh, many of them you have, you, you have visited. So if we could go to the next slide, Anthea. And uh, I think we have one more showing. Uh, thank you, Anthea. Of course, all the details of development, including ingress, egress, landscaping, standards, aesthetics, all these similar items are going to be guided by the LDRs. You have heard about the one change that's been requested. All of those things, by the way, site plans have been reviewed. I know you're not voting on the site plan tonight, but they have been reviewed. The only thing brought to your attention is a decrease in the size of the store, not an increase in the size of the store. Everything will be in accordance with the LDRs and SPRAB. While I believe that the city staff report demonstrates that each of the criteria in the LDR section 2.4.4 is met, let me run through them quickly. First is compatibility of the use with the nearby existing and proposed uses. What I've, what I've shown you, you can't deny it's compatible. In fact, compatibility doesn't really describe this use. This is an improvement in the use and in the uses in the area. But certainly, it is compatible with Jiffy Lube, with Goodyear, with the bank, with the convenience store, with the gasoline stations. Second is concurrency. As the staff report states, the Palm Beach County Traffic Division reviewed the project and found that the proposed project meets traffic performance standards. Uh, and, and it's always important to note, uh, IT raw numbers, Look, those are the numbers that are assigned to it, but there's a bottom line to this. The bottom line is, is obviously, we are just picking up passerby use. Um, no one is going to this as their primary destination. So not only are the numbers right, but we are treating the corner correctly in terms of its traffic pattern and what's going on there. We aren't adding to any particular problem. And, and water, sewer, all of the rather right concurrency items are met. The third item is consistency with the objectives of the comprehensive plan. The staff report notes that it will assist with food distribution and convenience. Racetrack has embraced this as a major portion of its business. It understands where the world is going, what the possible alternatives might be due to fossil fuels. As the prominent corner on a major intersection, and as the staff notes, it will not, it will not be the location for any major redevelopment 
for, for residential use or a different kind of commercial use. It sticks out. It's, it's almost one football field length on each side into that intersection. This is an out parcel. Given its trapezoid shape, it'll be an out parcel location regardless of what may be uh, uh, described for, it, for its use. So this fits with this site. And obviously, whatever might be in the comprehensive plan can't take away that basic nature of its location. Um, if it's not this use, you might expect it to be a fast uh, food. You might expect it to be a discount product emporium, such as Dollar General. You know, I looked at some of the other permitted uses in this zoning district, liquor stores, cocktail lounges, CBD oil establishments, uh, tattoo establishments, shooting ranges, but we all know given this particular location, this is an out parcel use. By the way, those, those are permitted uses. They don't have to go through the standards that Racetrack is going through right now that allows you to guide the development. They could just move into a 13,000 square foot building. Um, accordingly, this particular use is consistent with local policies affecting the area unless you interpret your code to mean that there is no viable use for the property except some of those permitted uses I mentioned. Having met those standards and knowing that you as a board are familiar with the process in Delray Beach, Florida for the approval of projects such as these, we ask that you concur with the staff report, grant a conditional use and grant a waiver to decrease the size of the building. I know that these matters cannot always be framed in strict language of the code. And I've spoken to most of you and understand your concerns for your city. And given that, I, I would like to have Scott Friedman of Morgan Companies, an experienced out parcel developer and the person behind this project, to explain why the project will actually help this area. I know that's not part of your strict uh, uh, code uh, uh, requirements, but I think um, Scott can do that. Scott, are, are you able to get into the uh, 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 hearing? Is he listed? Mayor, he would need to be sworn in. Okay, so um, is, is he on, is he able to be um, brought in? I guess it's one of the call-in users, IT. And then once he is brought in, please have him be sworn in. I, I believe I'm on. Yep, you are. Oh. Okay, so if uh, oh. Ms. Kateri will swear you in. Thank you. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. You're recognized. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to talk briefly um, on a couple of points, most particularly on uh, you know the competition and why it's not only a good thing, but a necessary thing for the revitalization of a, of a city, and especially in an environment like this. Uh, there are ex two existing gas users on this intersection, as we've discussed, and during particularly in the planning, it was, it was brought up, well, why do we want another gas station? And, and I think that's a very valid point, but I think the answer is we don't. We want a better fuel service option. A lot of the feedback that we're hearing from the residents is that they're not really pleased with what's available from a safety standpoint, from a, a merchandising standpoint, from a convenience standpoint, and we feel we have a better mousetrap. We feel the company that we're representing has evolved to not just be fuel service anymore, but it, it meeting the, the needs, right? Uh, we're talking about fresh food. We're talking about real coffee. We're talking about an outside COVID-friendly eating area, very timely, and these are, these are transitions from a company that's trying, you know, important to stay relevant and meet the current needs. And one of the reasons that that's possible is a corporate structure. These are not mom and pop run stations. And, and you know, in, in some areas, that's, an, that's a good thing. But in other areas, with, especially with a service as important as fueling, you really want a proven operator who has procedures in place, who's mindful of safety and, and environmental concerns, and when you have a, a, an independent operator, you know, they can very easily be tempted by sales. Um, something as simple as kids coming in trying to buy uh, beer underage, well, now this mom and pop operator has to make a decision about making a little bit more money or following the rules. 
a corporate structure, there is no decision to be made. The manager on duty will not tolerate it. They have no incentive to make that sale. In fact, they have a disincentive. They will get in trouble with their corporate. And so they follow the rules. And in fact, they create rules, particularly to avoid these kind of problems. And when you're talking about fuel deliveries and you're talking about handling food and you're talking about security, it becomes very relevant and very important. Um, I think Mike mentioned, you know, simple things such as, you know, handing out free beverages to law enforcement. Well, that's a good thing. I mean, we all we all like our police and we all want to support them, but it's a little selfish as well by we're encouraging them to have a presence at our location. We don't want problems. We don't want loitering. We don't want vandalism. We don't want anything unseedy. We want our customers to come in to feel safe and to get the products they want conveniently. Michael also mentioned Walgreens is, is leaving. We have received formal notice from them. This, they're not renewing their, their option and the store is going to close. Now all of a sudden there's, there's a, a convenience need for that area and Racetrack has stepped up with their new prototype. Not only are they providing safe fueling, but they're, they're providing some of these other services as well. And we think that is incredibly important. Um, there are some other, you know, community-minded processes they have in place. They have a partnership with FDOT to make sure to provide critical fueling in emergency situations. These stores will have an emergency generator hookup in the event of some kind of large power outage. Immediately, they will be brought online to service the needs not only of the residents of the community, but the um, judicial infrastructure as well. And uh, you know, these are things you just don't find with the existing stations that are there now. They, there is an internal supply chain. They don't, you know, switch suppliers every two months because they can save a penny here, a penny there. And so the operators that are coming out to, to refuel are familiar with the environment. They're familiar with the equipment and the servicing. And so it, it eliminates problems. It's much more efficient. And that's why you find that uh, Racetrack has one of the best safety records of any of the national fuel providers, just for those reasons. Um, I also want to talk briefly about employment. Um, you know, a typical racetrack with their larger format employs about double the staff of a small fuel station. But more important than that, there's managerial positions, true managerial positions, not a small family unit, but people that, you know, get benefits and they have a career path. I mean, some of the gentlemen, that are with us are from Racetrack Corporate, you have marketing people, you have real estate people, you have all these different industries that are within one corporate umbrella that there really is, the, you know, the, the old joke of a stock boy ending up, you know, uh, as a CEO of a grocer can happen in this environment. You can be brought in a little part-time job that a lot of us started at and follow the career path into Racetrack Corporate for a really nice living. And I think that's another great, great feature um, of why we think it's important to have competition in this marketplace. Um, lastly, I just want to leave you with uh, one of the things I said in that letter is we don't see your potential approval as agreeing to another gas station. We see it as an opportunity the city has to really begin the steps of revitalizing a very important corner. Uh, we know as we're in this industry, we get calls all the time. People are very familiar with the product, the projects we're working on. And when this one was announced, we do know there is very real interest from other national retailers if the first domino starts to fall. If someone revitalizes, especially the largest available out parcel in this intersection, some of the more uh, moderate sized ones then can be afforded by some of these other users. So this is a really great opportunity to take that first step. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Scott. Thank you, Michael. I have one more speaker, Samantha sure. Jones, who's with Racetrack. This is a, just quickly on the issue of uh, underground gasoline tanks, the safety and the changes in the regulations since the other gasoline stations were installed. Samantha's here and she'll walk up. I got it. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you so much. As Michael mentioned, I know we've heard concerns about the technology and the safety aspect of underground fuel tanks. Just a minute, just a minute. Something's wrong with the, uh, the microphone. I don't know what it we is. We have to mute this microphone. microphone. Also, Mayor, if Ms. Jones can confirm whether she's been smoking. I can't hear you, Lynn. If Ms. Jones needs to confirm whether or not she's been smoking. You 
you mute that one recording? and come over here. Unmute it. Get out of that yeah, room there. Yeah. I have to. That way it'll come back. Just mute it. Yeah. Something I want to look at here. That should probably okay. be better. Ms. Jones, were you sworn in? I was. Okay, thank you. So sorry, I'll just start over with my thank you for having us and thank you for uh, Michael for the introduction. As he mentioned, my name is Samantha Jones. I'm with Racetrack Petroleum Corporate out of Atlanta. Um, it has been brought to our attention that there is some concern about underground fuel tanks and the general safety of them long term. So I just wanted to touch on a few uh, standards that you know Racetrack is very proud to to bring to all of our sites and are able to maintain due to our, our corporate, corporately owned and wide range of stores around the state of Florida and around the Southeast. All of our underground fuel storage tanks are double walled as well as our piping. They're fiberglass, they're equipped with inventory and sensor monitoring, audible alarms and shutdowns associated with any potential leaks to mitigate that in the rare event that it may happen. All the underground tanks are equipped with fuel delivery shutoff valves, lim limiting those to 95% of the tank capacity to prevent overfilling, as well as the fuel dispensers being equipped with underground containment sumps to capture any miscellaneous drips that may occur during servicing or um, use from one of our customers. We meet or exceed all local, uh, county, and state regulations for the tanks themselves and of course any long-term monitoring upgrades and installation of those tanks and we also have UL approved components for all of the electrical items associated with that fuel storage piping and dispensing. We also have the emergency shutdown switches which are located within 100 feet of any fuel component that allow an operator or a customer who sees something um, to cause that system to shut down to mitigate any potential issue, again, in the rare event that one may happen. Um, we also can uh, conduct annual routine testing as well as triennial testing of all of our components and confirm that we um, meet all DEP emission standards as well. So um, as you can imagine, as a larger corporate brand, we have both the personnel and the resources and the incentive to ensure that all of our fuel stations are operating at the top safe level of, of use. So with that, I will uh, kick it back to Michael unless there are any questions. Thank you, Samantha. Michael, does that conclude your presentation? That, that concludes, we, we hope to have an opportunity to speak to you. Obviously, we have rebuttal um, a time, but we hope we have an opportunity to engage in a conversation with you so that a great decision can be made for the city of Delray Beach with respect to this corner. Thank you. Um, Thank to the staff, uh, Anthea, your presentation. Sure. Um, good evening, Anthea Genetics Development Services Director. Um, there are two resolutions before you tonight. One is for the conditional use related to the gas station itself and the others related to uh, allowing the size of the gas station to be slightly smaller than the current LDRs require. Um, just to give you um, kind of an overview of the area um, that this is proposed in, this is on the southwest corner of West Atlantic and South Congress. It is currently the Walgreens. Um, and there were several um, neighboring businesses that um, Mr. Weiner presented, the Chevron is on, uh, the northeast corner, the shell is um, directly um, across on the southeast corner. This is the proposed site. Um, so uh, this is the Congress Square Shopping Center. This is an out parcel. There's another one with banks and offices on it. And the recently approved Aura Mixed Use, which is predominantly residential, is um, across the street. And um, anyway, this is the surrounding area, the interchange to 95, which um, makes this probably a a desirable gas station intersection. Um, the, the property is zoned PC. Um, the current use, of course, is the Walgreens and the proposed use is racetrack. Um, the proposal in front of you is to demolish the Walgreens, the 13,305 square foot retail pharmacy, 
and uh, build a new racetrack that has a 5,411 square foot convenience store um, with an outdoor patio. Um, this is the configuration on the site plan, and the site plan isn't before you, but just in terms of understanding the impacts to the surrounding area, um, the proposal is um, underneath an, an 8,622 square foot canopy. There will be uh, 10 fueling stations. Each station has two pumps, so it's 20, 20 pumps. Um, and ultimately, uh, the request requires action on the two resolutions. There is uh, sort of covered outdoor seating to the side. I think it was it was um, evident in the um, in the presentation for the applicant. Um, the graphics you can see this is there's this area, and it's important to note that you know those use areas, even though they're outside the build, building, they are required um, to be parked. So um, here's just a quick overview of the canopy and the store um, that are proposed. Um, so in terms of the conditional use for the gas station, ultimately the findings are that establishing this use is not going to have a detrimental effect upon the stability of the neighborhood within it which, which it would be located. In this instance, um, the site is more than 700 feet away from a residentially zoned property or is not technically residentially zoned. It's predominantly residential, but it's a mixed use district. It is at the sort of gateway into um, the Congress Avenue um, corridor, um, which I'll touch on in a minute. And then ultimately, if you approve a racetrack here, is it going to hinder development or redevelopment of nearby and adjacent parcels? Um, you also have to evaluate it in terms of section 311 finding. Um, the zoning itself is compatible with the existing land use, so that's not an issue. Um, in terms of concurrency, really the issue to out of traffic, water, sewer, solid waste, et cetera, there's a full analysis and staff report. But the highlight is ultimately that this will increase traffic. 1,110 external trips will be generated from this conversion from a pharmacy to a gas station. And the county has um, found the, the amount um, to be in compliance um, with um, the um, we're trying to look for the assessment name. However, um, the, the condition is that a, a right turn lane into the property is going to be required and a tapered left. So I wanna just be really clear on just physically what will change if this is approved is that this is the street looking south now. You can see the Walgreens in the background and there will be a right turn lane that will have to be incorporated. And then like they taper the left, I guess, as you're getting out. And I'm sure if you have questions, uh, Mr. Winter, um, team can probably explain it um, better than I'm doing, but I just want to be, you know, just clear on what changes if this comes in. Consistency with the comprehensive plan, um, consistent with what we see with industry trends with larger gas stations. This one does propose a deli and sandwiches and some level of fresh fresh food that um, is not, has not in, you know, past been common for gas stations, um, which, which does help provide, you know, additional access to food in the area. Um, can, and then conversely, I think the balance to that is that we do have a comprehensive, comprehensive plan policy related to really the vision for Congress Avenue. We have another policy that asks us to, to actually go back in and study that corridor to determine the appropriate mix of uses, which is something that we've had to react to most recently as development has picked up in the corridor. Um, we have a policy that suggests that the vision of the next great street is something that we need to to keep in mind um, as we make decisions about the corridor. Um, and so, you know, that that document um, strives for a traditional transit-oriented development pattern. Um, you'll remember always Delray focused that within a quarter mile of our tray up fire rail station. A half mile of the station area that that just barely um, brings this property into that realm, but it is in it within a half mile station area, but it's beyond the quarter, which is traditionally the TOD core. So these are things to think about long long term, and as our comp plan guides us, the waiver itself is related to um, the code, which requires that a freestanding structure has to have a minimum floor area of 6,000 square feet. Um, and ultimately, what is proposed is a building that is 5,411 square feet. And then keep in mind, there is that exterior use area, the patio, um, which um, 
you know, adds, um, I think it's 565 more square feet, yes, to the overall development, which brings together the outdoor and the indoor use area close to that level of activity. Um, so, and then, so ultimately, um, you know, the site itself appears large enough to accommodate the minimum building size. They have four more parking spaces than they need. So could a larger building be accommodated potentially? Um, however, as we look at redevelopment at the next intersection towards the west, um, that's in a district that requires a 4,000 square foot minimum building, which this building would meet in that district. And we have had recent development along West Atlantic Avenue kind of within this realm. So these are things you should think about. It's the Chick-fil-A that's just been built is a little over 5,000 square feet. Chili's is just under it. So this is somewhat compatible with what we've seen coming in the area, or in size at least, um, in, in the area. The waiver itself though, and ultimately what you have to weigh, is whether allowing that smaller size structure is gonna have a negative effect. Um, and um, if it's gonna diminish public facilities, is it gonna create an unsafe situation if the building is slightly smaller? Um, and is it gonna result in a special privilege um, the conditional use went to planning and zoning board. The waiver comes straight to this board. Um, and it, this project received a split recommendation, three to two approval. Um, at the time, there were um, suggestions from the board that there be provisions included for electrical vehicle charging stations, that there be additional landscaping to shield the dumpster area. Um, while the applicant verbally agreed to them, this is these types of things that are included would be something that would be reviewed when the site plan itself goes to staff. I think the EV charging stations themselves might be something you wanna um, give direction on if you do uh, approve this moving forward. And you know, just to be clear, the staff has provided an analysis of what the LDR requirements are related to setback of canopies, to underground storage tanks, tanks to the parking. To the, to the proposed uses as they relate to other LDR requirements. Um, we don't actually provide a recommendation of the findings. This is in the planning board's purview to provide a recommendation to you, and then you will also um, weigh all of this analysis and the, and the applicant's justification and, and make the decision. So just to be 100% clear, staff is just giving you the background that yes, the LDR requirements that we have related to um, the use of a gasoline station have been um, demonstrated on the site plan. So I'm here if you have any questions and that um, completes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthea. Um, okay, so we're gonna take five minutes for anybody who would like to speak to this issue. This is quasi-judicial. Um, please call in now. Um, we will return at 5.38.
All right, it's uh, 5.38. You can all come back. Ms. Kateri, do we have any um, comments? Yes, we do. Mayor. Okay, great. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me start off with um, Lynn Jellen. Excuse me. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Um, Mr. Schiller is on the line on this um, item. He represents, um, is, uh, I think it's a neighboring uh, property owner. Um, he had requested party intervener status, and I did send him a letter um, declining that request and denying it. Our local rules do not provide for that. However, um, I think in fairness, um, if the commission were inclined to provide him with six minutes um, to present his case, I think that's fair. As a party intervener, he would be entitled to present his own case, cross-examine witnesses, present witnesses. And because our local rules specifically do not allow for that, um, that request was denied. But um, I know that the Planning and Zoning Board did give, afford him six minutes. And I think um, just out of fairness, I don't have an objection to that. Nor do I. Does anybody else have an object objection? Okay, I, I say we just, uh, should we do that now before the um, actual uh, comments are read? Sure. I, I think so. I know there's a presentation. Okay, so Mr. Shelley, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I have a, a brief presentation. I think uh, staff is going to, Anthony is going to click for me. No. Okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, hopefully, I'm going to hear from somebody in a minute if we have it. I don't see it in the folder. Sorry. Oh. Mayor, if you want to go forward with the uh, voicemails while we get this figured out, that may be a better use of time. That sounds like a good idea. So let's go ahead. Uh, Kateri, um, go ahead and play the comment, and then we'll um, come to Mr. Schiller. Hello, this is Sherry Ann Spagnolo. I have been sworn in and I live at 153 Coconut Key Lane in Delray Beach. And I'm calling about the proposed racetrack um, near Atlantic and Congress. And just wanted to mention that I am for the racetrack being developed there, um, primarily because I believe that, you know, after hours um, when it's dark at night, I think the racetrack would provide a much safer environment than the other two. Um, gas stations if I needed gas at night because from what I've seen with other racetracks they are very brightly lit and they're very clean just provide a safe environment or a safe feeling and the other thing is um, I strongly believe that they would provide a better convenience items uh, for people who are driving by in the area whether it be during the week or during the weekend um, than the other two options and with the Walgreens no longer there I think that'd be a great replacement thank you very much have a great day Good morning, Mrs. Mayor and City Commissioners. I hope all is well. Regarding today's City Commission Agenda Item Number 7A, a conditional use approval for another gas station at Congress and Atlantic, please look closely at the proposal and vote, no, on this item. Please look around our city and you will note that there are more and more electric vehicles being driven, and more are being purchased every day. A trend that is expected to escalate in our city with the opening of a new Tesla dealership on South Federal in the near future. In addition, the retrofitting of other long-established dealerships in our city for electric vehicle sales and service has occurred, including Volvo, Volkswagen, etc., further solidifying the trend toward less and less gas-powered vehicles. Our city needs more charging stations, not more gas stations. Please save conditional use approvals for items that will enhance our city and take it further and more efficiently to the 21st century. Please don't use this important tool for another gas. Also, please save the important Congress Avenue corridor for industry, for good job creation, and for transit-oriented uses, not for more gas stations. Regarding item number 7, B, please approve the addition of more townhomes to Atlantic Grove, to be located just off of West Atlantic. More housing, especially homes priced for normal working people, are sorely needed in our city and New Urban is a proven good steward of development in our city and, particularly, in the West Atlantic area. Please vote yes on this item. 
Thank you for your attention to these important items, and for all the good work you do for our wonderful city. Very appreciated. Christina Morrison Yes, my name is Melody Lunsford, L-U-N-S-F-O-R-D. I live at 135 Tangerine Trail. I also own property adjacent to me. I have two lots. There are four residents on Tangerine Trail. Bob, myself, I own two, two properties, and Charles. We are concerned about the extension of Tangerine Trail going from Seacrest to Swinton, and we are opposing it. I have lived in Delray for 60 years. I've owned my home for 21 years, and I love the privacy and the big open area that we have here. I definitely am concerned about the schools adjacent to the road that would compromise for students walking home from school. And I think a walkway and a bicycle lane would be fine. But I do not want a road going through. It's a very quiet, private neighborhood, and we enjoy it. Please consider that. And let me know what I can do. My number is 561-706-6451. 135 Tangerine Trail. I appreciate it. Thank you. That concludes the messages that we received, Mayor. Um, Kateri, did those messages come in specifically during the time that we actually um, uh, permitted? Because they weren't even pertaining to this particular, two of them didn't pertain no. to this particular thing. Those two two of the messages came in prior. The last message that was played was that came in during the break that we just took. Oh, okay. Yes. I just you know I mean it's it, I don't know if we can um, I don't know how how to do that to segment it off. But anyway, because uh, it it just didn't even pertain. Um, regardless, uh, does Neil? It looks like you've got your uh, you got your little presentation just, ready. Yes. Thank you so much. You Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. Again, Neil Schiller, for the record, it's all you and Arnstein and Lair representing Congress Square uh, Limited tonight, which is adverse to the racetrack. Next slide. We're asking you to deny the applicant's request. And he, uh, Lynn provided a great explanation about the party intervener. Just for the record, I would object to my client not being considered a party intervener as uh, uh, an adjacent property owner. But again, we ask you to deny the request for the conditional use for the gas station, failed to require to prove required findings, no confident substantial evidence, detrimental effect on the stability of the neighborhood, and will hinder development of the nearby properties. Next slide. This is, uh, I'm going to go through slides three through nine. Actually, um, uh, Anthea, if you just want to go to slide nine, uh, these slides are, are duplicative. They're aerials. There are some uh, location maps. There are some comprehensive plan policies that we feel the, the application is inconsistent with. But I really want to get to the meat of the presentation, which is in slide, uh, slide nine, starting in slide nine, which is their proposed site plan. So this proposed site plan, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, one, the canopy is extremely large. Number two, there are five underground storage tanks just 16 feet away from the sidewalk on West Atlantic Avenue that will be un uh, underground and, and, and sunken. Uh, 20 fuel stations with tw or 10 fuel stations with 20 pumps. Uh, Noxus uses at the rear of the convenience store. You can see the Dunkin' Donuts. That green building is my prop is my client's uh, building and property. That Dunkin' Donuts is extremely popular, um, and yet they put the the back of their convenience store uh, literally uh, twelve feet from the property line. Next slide. So uh, to get a conditional use, you have to uh, find two specific things. Have, uh, does this have a significantly detrimental effect on the stability of the neighborhood? 
We think it does because not only does it remove parking spaces for use by the shopping center, like Dunkin' Donuts for its tenants, uh, the property is elevated with no evidence submitted about the depth of the guest tanks, site ac access and circulation for tanker trucks doesn't seem realistic. Uh, their gas stations are not stabilizing developments for any area. The signage is bad. And uh, it says that the applicant will generate an additional 10 tons of additional solid waste over the existing use every year. Next slide. So loss of valuable parking, you can see what's being reduced here. Uh, the In the red, all of that parking is being taken away off of the site. This is valuable parking for the shopping center. You may say, well, this is the out parcels parking. Unfortunately, it's not. The uh, Both the out parcel and my client have rights to all of the shared parking in the development. And then additionally, they're removing, um, uh, they're reducing 38 east spaces to 17 spaces, which, which will also affect the parking ability of my clients uh, a built a, a shopping center. Next slide. The site is elevated. If you've driven by there, you've seen that the site is elevated about five feet from grade. How does that affect bearing the guest tanks? We don't know. How does that affect the elevated drainage? We don't know. Next slide. And those are site plan related issues. But again, when you're talking about burying gas tanks and a gas station, these are things to take into consider with a conditional use. Same thing as the tanker trucks. How are the tanker trucks moving in? We have grave concerns about the safety of the tankers to be able to get in and out of the site safely. Next slide. There are three gas stations, there are two gas stations on this corner. Uh, Mr. Friedman just said he doesn't want there to be three gas stations anymore. He wants there to be one or two. Um, I don't think that that's right. Uh, but no other intersection in the city has three gas stations. Um, and additionally, another gas station will add to the environmental impacts so of fuel spillage, idling cars, and increased greenhouse gases. This is not an environmentally friendly project, let's be honest. Next slide, please. Uh, again, I looked at all the gas stations in the area, and you can see that at most one intersection has three gas stations. And if you go further west to Military Trail, you see the Speedway, a shell, and then you even see another shell on West Atlantic Avenue. I think West Atlantic already has enough gas stations. No other gas station is needed in this area. Next slide. Nor have they shown or proven any need. There are significant environmental impacts on gas stations. Uh, including uh, carcinogens that are released into the air based on drops of gasoline that are uh, leaked from, from the pump. And there are studies to show that here's one of them. Next slide. Uh, signage, you know, this is an iconic, uh, not an iconic corner, but this is a very busy corner. Um, I don't know that the racetrack sign being lit up 24 seven is uh, a sign that this necessarily the city wants, nor does it follow uh, Delray's next great street plan, which is recommendation nine, initiate and invest on the beautification plan for the properties along Congress Avenue, including new welcome signs, banner poles and enhanced landscaping to create a strong sense of place. All this really does is create a strong sense of racetrack. Next slide. Does this hinder development or redevelopment of nearby properties? Absolutely. Why? Because as soon as you develop a gas station, it costs at least $500,000 to remediate it and turn the property into something else. And you guys know that as sitting as the CRA, because that exactly is what is happening to that gas station property on West Atlantic Avenue. It costs money to redevelop uh, gas stations and it costs money to clean up the environmental issues uh, with gas stations. Uh, lenders are weary about unclean properties, uh, which hinders future development, deters investment in nearby properties by establishing a dirty use and keeping it open 24 seven. You just have this beautiful aura project. You're gonna uh, have a gas station 700 feet away from it. That's open 24 seven, that doesn't seem right nor does the additional 10 tons of solid waste every year seem like that will uh, allow for the development or redevelopment of nearby properties. Next slide. 
And then lastly, uh, with 24 seven operations obviously leads to increased crime. Here is a report from the US Department of Justice that says everything we already know. Crime is more likely to occur when in the middle of the night when there are not uh, people around. So, Mr. Taylor, yes, it's Time's been up. Six okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, any questions, uh, I would greatly appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, moving on to um, the cross examination portion of our um, quasi judicial hearing. So, we're going to go to um, the uh, applicant. And this would be Mr. Weiner. Is he here? I don't see him. I have no cross examination. I do have rebuttal. Okay, no problem. And to the city um, staff, um, cross examination on anything? Uh, no, I do not. Thank you. Okay, so let's move to rebuttal testimony. That would be for um, Mr. Sh Mr. Weiner. Um, there was large discussion at the uh, planning and uh, zoning board, which was a favorable outcome about uh, the conversion uh, from uh, uh, gasoline to electric. Um, arrangements are made for the infrastructure to this property at the right time and at the appropriate time. Conversion will be made. Of course, we are not going to sell gasoline when gasoline is no longer, uh, when people no longer wish to purchase gasoline. Important economic decision, the right one will be made by racetrack. This is an out parcel. That's what it is. I have brought to your attention the fact that certain permitted uses in this zoning district, this is not a residential zoning district, in this zoning district would allow for liquor stores, cocktail lounges, uh, Dollar General could move in with a paint shop and a new sign. Um, if we are going to have investment in this community and in this area, it is through the racetrack type uh, development, um, that is what will improve the properties. So it is certainly not significantly detrimental. I proved that, I demonstrated that. You can see what's happened by the inattention to that area. If this is refused tonight, you will only be increasing what is the present situation in that area. No one has spent money to capitally improve uh, any of those uh, out parcels. Um, what you're hearing is a private dispute over a private easement. That's all. If they have the rights, I am sure they will assert the rights. The remainder of the uh, discussion uh, from the neighboring property owner was for site plan. That was it. It was only site plan. We will get rid of our garbage properly. We will park properly. All of those things do not have to do with the use. And they do not have to do with the use that actually the standard in the code is that we just have to not be significantly detrimental. We could be a little bit detrimental. That's what your code actually says. And we could still meet all the criteria, but we are not significantly and we are not even a little bit. We are actually increasing the chances of that area finally getting the investment they need to remove the substandard operations and obsolete operations in that particular corridor. So quite honestly, I'm sure we'll have debates over signage and over parking, but the fact that the Dunkin' Donuts might have a competitor, and maybe they need a competitor, is not a reason for refusing this particular use when it meets the standards of your code. Let's, Brad, get into all the things that uh, Neil mentions. I'm sure they will. There's been a review of them already, and we have certain feedback, but on this, please, I, I, I know I've spoken to you. I know that in you, you want to try to make the best decision you can. If we pass this one by and we pass by millions of dollars in, in, in development work on this, then other proposals will come for, for this trapezoid, this, this, this sticking out into a 40,000 car day uh, uh, intersection. And those proposals, they could get away without spending a buck. This is a good decision for this corner. I'm hoping you see that not only because it meets the standards of your code, but you understand that there's good reasons to bring in capital, jobs, and development in that place at this time. Thank you. Appreciate your efforts.
Thank you, Mr. Weiner, um, to the city staff for um, rebuttal. I just wanted to add, um, just draw your attention to part of the analysis. I, I know that um, there's some concern about the increase in solid waste. And so I, I just wanted to point out the analysis and the staff report shows that the service station is relatively, um, since, you know, almost the same as the solid waste generated by the pharmacy. It's the restaurant square footage that is generating the extra 10 tons. So we considered that, but the use of tipping it over seemed to be a desirable use. And that's part of why I didn't highlight it specifically. So thank you. Thank you very much to the commission. You want to start out? I have a couple of questions just real quick. Um, maybe I can ask uh, uh, staff. Uh, number one, I wanted to ask about, there was a, um, a question about the sidewalk where the um, uh, the ingress or the, the turn lane that would be added, would the sidewalk then be to the west of that? So in other words, we're not losing a sidewalk there, correct? Correct. The, the sidewalk will have to track the new um, turn lane and the applicant, um, and this of course is, is Congress, so the county is involved in, in the design solution as well. Okay, and then the other question that I had was that um, the question about uh, that Mr. Weiner, you made early on, uh, you said that the racetrack, or, or I'm sorry, the um, Walgreens building, is that what it is, a Walgreens or is it a CVS? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Anyway, okay, Walgreens, Walgreens. Walgreens building is two and a half times the, uh, the size of the racetrack building. Now, we're talking about just the convenience store part of it, not the entire thing with the with the uh, covered uh, area and whatnot, right. right? No, that's true. Okay. That is true. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we were aware of that. Um, and those were the two questions that I really had that I had personally. So, let me go to the uh, commission reserve any other questions for later. Um, we're just, I don't know where we're starting. Uh, we'll start at the top. Uh, Mayor, Commissioner Boyle. Mayor, oh, I'm, Mayor, may I you start? Yes. No, yes. no, I was just going to suggest I don't know if it was Commissioner, I'm sorry, uh, Vice Deputy Mayor um, Boylston or Commissioner Cassell, but I was third. Thank you very much. So let's start with uh, Commissioner uh, Boylston. You'll, you'll be first and you'll follow by um, uh, Commissioner Cassell. Great, great, thank you. Um, so first I'd just like to say, you know, that I appreciate um, your interest in Delray Beach. And uh, I, am a, I am a customer, I've been inside a racetrack and I appreciate um, the way in which you're elevating uh, gas stations all over our county, our state, and probably, you know, and beyond. Um, and I hope that, you know, we might see an investment uh, from racetrack, you know, in the future. Um, however, I, I do not think you met either of um, of the stipulations put forward in order for us to grant this. Um, so I, I, Mr. Weiner, I, I, I disagree with you um, on on both those and both those items. Um, and and, I, and thank you staff for pointing out that there is investment coming to this area. Mr. Weiner, you you mentioned that there isn't. There is. Uh, you have the Aura project right across the street and and even more important, right right next to that, you have our county have just expanded 3,800 square feet of office space for Palm Tran to 36,000 square feet. That was a $25 million investment. So we have jobs coming to Congress and we have residential coming to Congress. And we also have some additional mixed use um, that we don't know the tenants of yet. So we do have investment happening all around, all around your project. And, um, and this isn't a conversation about the you know, the scary things that could go there, not that I think a liquor store or a cocktail lounge or a dollar store are, are scary alternatives. Um, this, is, this is a conversation that's simply about whether or not we want to, you know, allow this to happen in our, uh, on that corner and whether or not you met the, um, the two items there. And I, and I, I don't believe you, you have, and I'm curious to hear what my, uh, what my colleagues think. Commissioner Thanks. I, I'm, I'm somewhat in agreement and I, I'm concerned also about, you know, this um, stability of the neighborhood. And while I appreciate that this isn't centrally uh, residential, we did see in the plaza almost, you know, diagonally across with public when they started losing businesses, the building deteriorated, homeless people were 
living there and it became problematic and i do know and and you know not something to consider but i think uh, mr schiller was concerned that that the duncan is an anchor business and i believe it's a family-owned business and uh, and there's also a subway which is also a family-owned business that would be impacted um by this and so thus ultimately probably um causing a stability issue so I, i'm in agreement with uh, commissioner boylston Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yes, I am first of all would like to apologize to uh, to Deputy Vice Vice Deputy Mayor um Frankel. <laughs> I'm sorry, Commissioner Boylston. Uh I am very curious as to why the traffic report did not factor in that we're getting ready to um produce or have a project called Aurora, Aurora, and there's going to be traffic generated there. And when I looked at the traffic report for this uh, establishment, I was astonished. That intersection is not compatible or as it now exists, I don't think it can handle that additional traffic with the, uh, the mixed use project that we're anticipating. And I have seen gas stations on three different corners. The most prominent to my mind, and I believe there's a racetrack there, would be north of the Palm Beach State uh, College intersection. And I don't know, I know it's Congress and something, but I don't know what the Congress, um, Lake Worth Road, Lake Worth Road and Congress. And it is very wide. There are three gas service stations, and Racetrack did not put the other two out uh, out of business. Uh, they're a little bit more um, nice. I like Racetrack. I like all service stations, but I think this is just the wrong business at that intersection. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Vice Mayor um, Frankel. Thank you. Um, uh, First of all, I, I applaud the comments that have occurred. And I too, based on the findings we have to make in our uh, LDRs, uh, 2.4.5 E5 in particular, there's a few things here that I find problematic uh, regarding having a detrimental effect on the stability of the neighborhood where this proposed racetrack would be located. Uh, first, to my knowledge, and I think Mr. Schiller uh, pointed this out, I, I can't identify any intersection within the city with three gas stations. And the, am I right? In the city, do we have any in the city limits? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's okay. I, I couldn't get to the unmute button. <laughs> my computer wasn't um, cooperating. Um, or it was user error, entirely possible. Um, so to be fair, I, I didn't check that. I don't think that there is. And part of the reason I didn't look at it is we don't have separation criteria specifically. But, um, you know, in terms of west of 95, I, I, I don't believe so. I, if I'm wrong, then maybe the applicant can, can correct me. But so, and, 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 and to the best of my unscientific research of driving the city uh, since 1998, uh, I don't recall seeing any uh, in the city right. limits. Um, I'm concerned about a 24 hour operation. Um, I don't think that has a great effect, particularly within a close distance to A95. Um, and I was also troubled by some of the comments made, uh, respectfully uh, made by Scott Friedman. Uh, the comment today that mom and pop stores more likely would sell alcohol to children out of concerns for profit. And then in the email where he referred it on April 1st, uh, basically saying that uh, we should approve racetrack and then the other two gas stations need to improve their uh, uh, businesses or they're gonna go out of business. Uh, I don't think that's right. I just don't. And I'm also uh, uh, with the LDRs about the tanker trucks. Um, that's a 10 intersection. I think there'll have to be, if this approved, many U-turns. It's a tough intersection as it is. And I just respectfully at this time 
can't see how it makes that uh, finding a positive finding under 2.4.5 E5. So uh, respectfully, I'm not going to be able to approve it tonight. Thank you. Well, I'm going to be the one on the uh, under end of the spectrum, I guess. I, I kind of saw this as being a great uh, improvement to um, what is uh, there, a, a way to be able to, I mean, I've, I've been to racetrack uh, um, uh, gas stations. I prefer them. They're lit. They're safe. They're convenient. Um, they're clean. These are the things that I look for. I don't necessarily find that to be the case in some of the other um, gas stations that uh, that are currently existing. I don't see how a 24-hour operating gas station on the corner of what is virtually um, I-95 is, is is such a bad thing. I mean, especially if you're coming down the interstate, you need to find a place. Um, again, the tanker trucks moving around is not my business. That's a, uh, that's a scrap um, issue. Stability of the neighborhood, I don't think that it affects the neighborhood. I think that we have um, two other uh, gas stations on two other corners that uh, prove that to be the case. Um, however, I don't think that um, I'm going to be in the majority. So I guess it really doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, if uh, there's no other comments, uh, Mr. Boylston, do you have still have your hand up? No. Okay. Um, if there's no other comments, then let's just move to uh, Mayor. motion. Yeah. Just just a reminder that there's two two separate resolutions yes, and each yeah, of us right, we take right. individual. Correct. So make, make sure you take each one individually. Anybody? Sure. I make a motion to deny resolution 06-21. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? No. Second resolution, make, please. Yep, yeah, make a resolution to deny resolution 48 21. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Wilson? No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? No. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weiner and um, Mr. Uh, Friedman, and also Ms. Jones and uh, Oh, Mr. Schiller. There you go. Thank you, Mayor. Very much. Moving on to 7B. Resolution 57-21. Uh, uh, this one has two as well. There's also 58. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. This has two resolutions, 57 and 58-21. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I do see that now. Thank you. Good evening. Um, and the Genetics Development Services Director for the record. Um, these are two resolutions related to um, a class four site plan modification, certificate of appropriateness, um, landscape plan, architecture elevations, and providing for an increase in residential density through the Central Business District Incentive Program. Um, there's a waiver, which is the second resolution. Um, this item is coming before you because um, when density increases are sought in the Central Business District, specifically the West Atlantic Neighborhood Subdistrict, um, the typical site plan review board, in this case, the Historic Preservation Board makes a recommendation and then the final approval is before this board, um, which then can review the density increase holistically with a, an entire site plan in front of you. Um, so with that, I would like to enter file 2020-281 into the record. And I believe um, Kim Hernandez is here uh, for Mayor, the yep. presentation. Mayor, we're this is quasi-judicial, so we need to yeah, disclose that part. The witness. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to swear in the witness, and then we're going to go into the disclosure of ex parte. So let's go ahead and swear in witnesses. By the authority vested in me. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, and so ex parte communication, if there are any, let's start with the um, vice mayor. I have none. Okay, very good. Deputy vice mayor. Yes, I, I received an email and I spoke to the real Christina Morrison, not the computer Christina Morrison. What was that all about? Okay, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we did get her message, however. Um, uh, Commissioner Cassell? I don't believe I've received any email or had any ex parte communication on this project. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Boylston? Yeah, I don't believe I have either. And I'm not, I don't think that I have either. I don't recall anything coming through on even um, my uh, email. So. Um, we'll move on to uh, the uh, applicant um, and, and allow the applicant to present. Is that Mr. Uh, Hernandez? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Good Good evening. Um, Tim Hernandez with uh, Atlantic Grove Partners, uh, 270, my old address. Uh, it's a uh, 200 Congress Park Drive, Suite 201, Delray Beach, Florida, 33445. So I have... Uh, with me uh, tonight on the call, I have uh, Kevin Rickard, my partner, longtime partner. We have Andrew Van Valen, our planning manager. And then on the phone uh, are Yvonne Odom and uh, Sebron Smith, who are our partners on this deal with their organizations, the TED Center and the uh, Delray Beach CDC. So let me go walk through the, the presentation. Um, I think uh, you can move to the next slide. Okay, so this project is about 18 years old now. Um, we developed Atlantic Grove. It was an, an RFP uh, that we won um, back in, I think about 2002 or 2003. We built most of it. There was one little piece of property that was left out. That's the subject of the, uh, of the, um, the application tonight. So next slide. So, Back in 2002, the, the Atlantic Grove mixed use development um, was approved under, at the time, a GC zoning. Uh, and there was a conditional uh, use that allowed a density of 16.54 units an acre. We built two mixed use buildings uh, that had retail on the first floor, office on the second floor, and 20 lofts on the, the third floor um, in the three and 400 blocks of West Atlantic. Uh, 55 townhomes were built behind the uh, in the 300 block, um, and you know still to this day, other than Coda, this is the only residential development that really that's happened along the uh, the West Atlantic uh, corridor in the West Atlantic neighborhood. A uh, very successful project. Um, one of the things that people may or may not remember about this is you hadn't passed the workforce housing. Uh, 4.7 section of the LDRs at the time. And so we had actually already been approved. We were um, we were actually uh, under development and had not really started selling any units yet. And the CRA approached us and said, would you be willing to set aside any of the, the homes for workforce housing? So we voluntarily at the time set aside 10 uh, housing units out of the 55 townhomes. We didn't set aside any of the lofts, but the townhomes, which were more suitable to, to families. Um, we sold 10 of those for 134,000, which was about a hundred and more, it's like it was about $107,000 less than the average uh, sale price of the townhomes, the rest of the townhomes, the other 45 that we sold. An interesting fact is that six of those 10 workforce housing units that we sold back in 2000 and, uh, two and to 2004 i think it was i think they actually closed in 2003 to 2004. six of those are still owned by the original owners the other four were sold um in april one was sold in april 2014 another was sold in february 2015 and two more were just sold um in 2019. so it's been a very successful uh program that we implemented there uh at atlantic grove so next slide So 
there was this one piece. This is this this graphic kind of shows you what has happened over the last uh, 18 years. So um, everything in yellow when we developed Atlantic Grove was owned by Mount Olive uh, Baptist Church, and the uh, what was in orange was the townhome section of Atlantic Grove, and what was in green was the condo uh, portion of Atlantic Grove, including the one kind of stray great green lot you know on the west side of northwest fourth that was surrounded on three sides by uh, mount olive and on the uh, on the east side there was uh um the yellow piece uh that was surrounded on three sides by the atlantic grove townhomes so um we we entered into an agreement you know back in 2002 or 2003 to to buy to, to swap those parcels basically to do a little land swap and um we it never happened there was some litigation it all got resolved uh back in 2019 end of 2019 and you know we've now to the next slide this is the way it looks now so we kind of squared everything off like it was expected to be back then so so we've given mount olive the parcel in between you know that we used to own um or the condo association actually owned but we as atlanta grove partners developed and then um we got title to the the, the missing you know square on the east side of northwest fourth avenue that was always intended to be the rest of the atlanta grove townhome section in fact we had even stubbed the utilities, you know, the sewer, the water, the drainage, the alleys, everything into that um, and had entered into an agreement with the association that this would just be, you know, come part of uh, the rest of the, the townhome section. So now that can finally be rea a reality. Also, um, the uh, there's a green area that's now that was the south part of, it, of uh, Mount Alice parking lot, which is now going to be given over to the condo association so they can have contiguous parking um, eventually so that's uh, part of this as well next slide okay so this in the, the red jagged area shows you know this was always basically the plan we made one little tweak to what we were talking about back in 2003 we've we have spent a lot of time working with the Atlantic Grove townhome association and one of the things that they said was um hey you know is there a way that we can expand the, our pool deck and so we've worked with them to be able to relocate the cabana a little bit further to the west from where it is now right now it's right up against you know the pool so now we're going to move it on to the area that we're you know that's our land now and um uh, it's going to be pretty cool. We're going to be able to expand the the pool deck for for them, and uh, we're also going to um, create the courtyard in the middle of the project. As you're looking at this slide, kind of the air the area between lots 48 through 55, which are existing, and lots 56 through 63, which um, we'll be building as part of our two buildings that we're going to build to complete the project. So now we'll have a nice green courtyard in the middle kind of like what you see at mallory square or at coda which is a really nice feature we always envisioned this we just since you know we didn't have the that missing portion of the land we were never able to be able to do it so next uh next okay so yeah okay you can yeah i guess it's a we're doing one one bullet at a time here but there's two new townhome buildings they're going to be built we're also one of which there will be one additional workforce housing unit provided, which is another good thing um, that we're doing as part of this project. We're also adding five parking parallel parking spaces along Northwest 4th Avenue, which will be available to be used by anyone, obviously, since they're in the public right away. There's the green courtyard that just popped up, central courtyard. And then the relocated in yellow, it shows up the relocated cabana and the expanded pool deck area next and there's the five parking spaces okay i didn't do it in the right order but i got it all so this is a aerial of what it currently looks like today the yellow is the square of land that we're talking about tonight next and then this is what it'll, it'll look like and you can see if you toggle back and forth between 
this slide and the previous slide, you can see, yeah, go to the, go to the one where it's not in there. Yeah. So you, okay. Yeah. You can see that the alleys and everything are stubbed in. It was always intended that it was, we we're going to complete the circulation loop inside that block. And now we're finally going to be able to do it with when this gets built. All right. Next. So here's the, the required uh, 3D view. You can see, you know, the existing buildings. You can see the police station, the courthouse, the library, the tennis center, uh, and in Mount Olive um, in the foreground. And you'll in the massing. Go back to that slide again. It's um, the previous slide. Yeah, you can basically see that what we're doing, the massing, the scale, the setbacks, they're all complementary to the uh, existing um, buildings that have already been built and the development pattern, you know, so they're all rear loaded uh, garages with parallel parking on the street. In fact, when we built Atlanta Grove, we even put parallel parking on the, uh, the east side of North West Third, you know, along the tennis center. So, I mean, you've all been out there and you'll see it. And this is, I think, um, you know, we're completing again what was envisioned. Um, 18 years ago. Next slide. There's the elevation. So we're, we're updating it a little bit, but it's it's largely the same as what we what we did before. I think uh, there, the existing association is going to be repainting, and we work with them um, on the color selection for our building. So I think they're going to be um, kind of taking what we're doing with these new buildings. They're due for a repaint in a couple of years, and so they're they're um, probably getting, I th I'm pretty sure. That that they're going to uh, match what we're doing now. And that's that's it. I'm here to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank we're excited so to be able to excited to be able to, to do something else in West Atlantic. Thank you, Tim. So now to Anthea for the staff report. Okay. All right. So um, there are two resolutions before you today. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview. You do have the full Historic Preservation Board staff report in the backup, and as well as a summary. Um, I think you have a, a good overview of obviously the location of the project and the intended build out. I do think it is important to note that the zoning has changed over time since the original Atlantic Grove was built. It is now Central Business District. It is within the West Atlantic Subdistrict. There is a different process. Um, and so, you know, we've been navigating that. Um, the current approved plan for Atlantic Grove looks like this. Um, and so what's happening is that some of the property is coming out, the additional property is coming in within the boundaries, and all of this will make room for um, 14 uh, new three-story townhomes to complete the pattern. Um, and again, they're going to demolish and replace the cabanas in the restroom and the, in the restrooms around the pool area. There's new hardscaping, there's new landscaping and streetscaping. And all of that um, is within, is, is what you are considering under uh, resolution number 5721. That's the actual site plan approval package that Historic Preservation weighed in on. And the reason the whole package comes to you again is because there is um, utilization of a density bonus in exchange for the workforce housing unit. Um, the second waiver is related to the roof material. There are, again, new standards related to that, and I'll go over that briefly. Um, that's the area of the proposed infill. There's the new buildings completing the streetscape, absolutely consistent with the existing scale and pattern that's there now. Obviously, the upgrades um, to uh, the the newer um, piece being filled in with the balconies that have um, some sheltered roofs on them. Um, because it's in a historic district, we do require streetscape. Um, and so with that first resolution, um, by way of the Historic Preservation Board's recommendation, you would be approving the Class 4 site plan modification, the actual COA, um, the elevations, the landscape plan, and authorizing the utilization of the incentive program um, 
which allows for an increase in density. Um, in this case, bringing it, it, it looks fairly minor because the project is so large, but it is a higher density than is sort of permitted by right on the site. And that is why it has moved through the process and come to you. The applicant has agreed um, to provide one of the new, new, pro new townhomes as a moderately priced workforce unit. Um, and so this is the reason why it comes here. You know, the past process is we had the conditional use that would get heard and the density would be decided and then the plans would go through SPRAB and, you know, the, the density didn't fit if we didn't do a waiver. And so this is the new um, sort of process that requires a holistic site plan to be presented to this board for, for, um, for approval. Um, and so that's what you see before you today. This is still taking in all of the criteria um, related to historic preservation approval, meaning the Secretary of the Interior Standards um, and the city's um, own visual compatibility standards, all of which was pre presented as well to the Historic Preservation Board for recommendation. Um, the waiver before you was related to the roof material. Um, the Central Business District um, Code requires um, a certain uh, level of Energy Star roof material. Um, the applicant has requested a waiver from this criteria to uh, utilize a roof material that is consistent with what is on the ground now. Um, I will let him speak to that if you have more questions about the specific material. Um, but ultimately related to that roofing material, um, the findings are the standard waiver consideration that it's not going to have an adverse effect on the neighborhood. This is solely to the roofing material and it doesn't diminish public facilities, create an unsafe situation. Is it a special privilege? And then also because it's in the central business district, there are additional criteria to consider, which is uh, would this have an effect on the pedestrian experience along a primary street? Um, is it going to create an incompatibility with nearby um, buildings? Um, is it going to erode connectivity of our street system and um, does it reduce the quality of the open space? Again, this is related to the material. Um, this project was sent to the Downtown Development Authority for a review and they gave a recommendation of approval in November of 2020. The Historic Preservation Board reviewed the full proposal, all of, um, all of this including the roof material as part of their um, review and they had a recommendation of four to zero and um, did not, like I said, have any concerns about the change in roof material and, um, you know, were quite supportive of the project, including the, um, particularly the participation of the not-for-profit partners in this, in this effort. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. And I thank you as well. So um, this is quasi-judicial, if anybody has any, um, Comments that would like they would like to make, please dial in now. We will take a five minute break. Come back at six thirty six.
All right, everyone, if we can come on back. Ms. Kateri, did we get any calls? We do have some messages that came in earlier today. None came in while we were on break, so I'll go ahead and play those. I do okay. want you, there is a message that's a little bit difficult to hear. Um, there is a barking dog, but I'll play it anyway. Hopefully you can hear the message. Thank you. Hello. I was sworn in. My name is Barbara Carey Shuler. My address is 12881 Cocoa Pine Drive, Washington Beach, Florida, 33436. I'm calling in about agenda item number 7D. I'd like for you to know that it's very important to the test center and the Del Rey Beach CDC because revenue generated from this project will allow us to continue to provide the much needed services counseling, training, and technical assistance to the community, especially during these difficult times for small businesses. Thank you for allowing me to make a comment. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Debbie Sattel. I reside at 378 Lake Monterey Circle, and I'd like to leave a comment for the Atlantic Grove project approval that's on the agenda for tonight. I um, just wanted to you know that I support it and I think it's really important for the TED Center and her, uh, the Delray Beach CDC uh, because the revenue generated from the project will help these nonprofits continue to provide much needed services to the community during these difficult times. Thank you very much. Yes, I was sworn in. My name is Yvonne Odom, 3905 Lawson Boulevard, and I am giving testimony to the Atlantic Road Project. I'm coming here in my, as my capacity of the longstanding community organization known as the Delray Beach Community Development Corporation, established over 20 years ago in Delray Beach. Over 17 years ago, we were one of two non-for-profit partners that was fortunate enough to win the bid to develop the Atlantic Road Project. We are now at the final phase, the last 14 units. This project has been a labor of love and an example of how a for-profit business and a nonprofit service organization partnership can work together on behalf of the Delray Beach community. The Delray Beach CDC, I am asking that you vote to move this were the project forward. For example, the 10 workforce units originally sold, six out of 10 of those units are still owners with a solid ownership and a sound investment in our community. The proceeds from the sale of these units will allow us to continue our work as a community because we are getting 50% of the proceeds, that's the two nonprofit. Our share is 25%, which will benefit us greatly as we work and do our work forward. Again, I ask for your yes vote to move this project. And on behalf of the Dairy Beach CDC, I sincerely thank you. Hi, my name is Eric Mintz. I live at 337 Atlantic Grove Way, Delray. This is in regard to New Urban and the uh, meeting today on April 6th. Um, I've been here since the beginning, bought new construction, moved in shortly after the CO. Uh, I'm currently the president of the HOA. I've been so for about the last five years. I've been on the board for well over 10 years. Um, the community did vote in the new units. Um, to be part of our HOA. Uh, this requires two-thirds vote. And 
you can trust me that getting two thirds vote on anything in here can be a heavy lift, but there was overwhelming support and optimism um, for this new construction. The community itself has really never been complete. It really requires those those new units and <clears throat> most importantly the courtyard. You know, the court lot the courtyard that they're gonna add will finally create a a real center to the community. Um, but then also we're gonna they're gonna we're gonna expand the pool area, uh, which is necessary. New Urban is, is throwing in um, about twenty one thousand to do it. They've been great to work with. Um, so they've been really good partners. Um, you know, this is a big job but really critical um, to the community, this expansion of the pool area, the new, you know, the new units, the 14 new units and uh, and the courtyard, of course. Uh, and in fact, our sister community, uh, new urban condos, right, the, the ones right along Atlantic Avenue, um, they have access to our pool, they share in the maintenance costs. I've, have a, I've had a conversation with Mike Caruso, Caruso who's the president. Um, we've got a good working relationship with them. Um, they've agreed. Um, to kick in some money as well, around 20 grand to expand the pool area because it's going to benefit benefit them as well. So we're really hoping that this new construction will get approved and become part of our HOA. I um, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Calderbank, and I live at 38 Northwest Third Avenue. Um, in Delray Beach in uh, a community known as Atlantic Grove. And I'm calling in reference to the item on today's agenda for Atlantic Grove. Um, I, I should also mention I am on the board of directors here uh, for the community association, the Townhouse Community Association. I'm very much in support of the project. We've worked very closely uh, with the guys at New Urban to um, kind of make sure the design works for us and them. Uh, we, in fact, plan to um, paint the, re the existing part of the community to match the color palette they've selected so that we um, look like a, uh, a single community and not two separate ones. So um, we're very pleased with that. We've also made agreements as to how we can improve the pool facility for both the new and existing property uh, owners. So um, we're in support of this. The board is here, um, and I would hope that you would uh, grant approval today. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Carol Howard. I reside at 1026 Southwest 7th Avenue here in the city of Delray Beach. I am calling regarding the project, the new urban approval project that's on the agenda for today. I am affiliated with the Delray Beach Community Development Corporation, also known as the Delray Beach CDC. I have been affiliated with this nonprofit organization that was established in 1992 as the secretary for over 20 years. I urge the mayor, vice mayor, and fellow commissioners to approve this project with New Urban. Our nonprofit we greatly benefit from this project so that we can continue our work and our mission in assisting individuals in establishing wealth and home ownership in our community of Delray Beach, Florida. I greatly appreciate your assistance in this matter and urge you to approve this project with New Urban. Thank you and have an awesome day. Okay, Mayor, that concludes our messages. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, cross-examination. Um, and this would be for, I guess, the staff, if you have any cross. And I believe there was, where's the applicant? I don't see the applicant. Oh, Tim, where is, I don't know where he went. Anyway, so let's start with Anthea. Any cross-examination? I do not. Thank you. Okay. How about rebuttal? Oh, there's Tim. Tim, do you have any cross uh, examination? No. Okay. What about rebuttal testimony? No. Okay. I can't hear you, but um, I see that you're shaking your head now. No. Okay. Okay. I hear you, okay. Tim. Try, try it again, Tim. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can. 
Okay. Yeah. No, I have no no cross and no no rebuttal. Okay. Very good. Thank you. To the commission, um, Commissioner Boylston. My question is for staff, and I apologize for not um, getting to this question prior to this this meeting. When the entire development has to um, re redo their roofs, will they have to meet the new standard? That is a good question. Um, they, yes, we would um, hold that change to the code now. Yes, I'm going to try to go back to what the code provision says. Because obviously the older buildings they, are going to be new roofs sooner than the new buildings. Know. But when they when they do the entire community, I just want to make sure that it is going to be held to the new standard and that we're not grandfathering in the entire community. Correct. Yes. Yeah. They when they came in for the, when they come in for the permit, it would be reviewed by the historic preservation staff as, and they would also um, consider um, the central business district standards as well. Okay. And, and, and just since we have the applicant, is that, is that understood? Um, I think you're on mute, but my, my point is because you yeah. may have, you may replace the old roofs and may actually be replacing the roofs on the newer units sooner than you may just to ensure that they're all, you know, complying at the same time. Yeah. Just yeah. so you understand a little bit about this, this whole, um, requirement it's very interesting there's you guys are looking for us to have an energy star rated um, roof in terms of what they call a solar reflectance and thermal emissivity okay those are the two terms so it's interesting if you look at um the standards that you guys have if you look at the energy star requirements they have one standard for a flat roof and a different standard for a steep sloped roof. Okay, we, we have 512 roofs here. Our roofs, as well as the existing roofs at Atlantic Grove, all the existing townhome buildings are co considered steep sloped roofs. So it's, it, it's a little hard for us to, to figure out exactly what the, what the actual requirement is because your code doesn't match the, we have to right now, we have to meet the strict requirements of your code. That's why we're asking for the waiver. I think you guys should maybe take a look at the code, to be honest with you, and create, follow the Energy Star guidelines. Because the reason that we asked for this waiver was this, because what the materials that our construction department has, has been looking at to use here, I mean, it's not obviously the same exact roofs roof shingles that were used 17 years ago, okay? There's, there's been product development and evolution over that period of time. So it looks like to us, we don't meet the, uh, the low standard, but we do meet the high standard. So if your, but your, but your um, code doesn't make the distinction between the two. So if your code followed Energy Star, I think there's an argument to be made that we would meet it. So that's, it's not quite as simple. So we just, in the abundance of caution, we we requested this waiver to make sure that we would not be somehow considered to be not in compliance. Great, thank you. That was my only concern as far as the first agenda item. I am I am very much in favor. I'm very excited to see you guys break ground. Thanks. We're we're also in the process of of. Um, looking at the green implementation standards citywide and so the issue that mr hernandez is raising certainly will take back um and look at the code under that lens now so thank you great thank you anthea is that it uh commissioner anyone else i don't see anybody uh, with hands up we can move to a, a motion Motion to approve resolution 57 21. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. 
Motion to approve resolution 58-21. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Call the roll, please. Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Franco? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Hernandez. Thank you all. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right, have a good time or night. Um, okay, so moving on to 7C, resolution 59-21, also quasi-judicial. So if we can, um, let's see here. We'll swear in the witness first. And I guess we have um, presenters or applicants. All right. Yes, I, think, I believe they're on the line. Okay. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yeah. Okay, great. And we're going to move to disclosure of ex parte communication by the City Commission, starting with the Vice Mayor. Yes, Mayor, thank you very much. I believe I discussed this with Ms. Bonnie Miskell. Okay, thank you. Um, Deputy Vice Mayor? None that I can recall. Okay, Commissioner Boylston? Yes, I've had multiple conversations with Ron Ellish. Okay, and Commissioner Cassell? I believe I might have received um an email on this at some point in time but beyond that no all right and i um believe that i spoke with um one of the partners and i don't recall who but i know i had a conversation but it was very early on so um we're excuse going me. to start with uh, excuse me yes i did i did speak to mr allen i'm sorry about that yeah Thank you, i believe sir. that that might have been who i spoke with as well um okay so um we will now go to city staff to enter the um, project file into the record. Um, yes, this is Anthea Genetis, Development Services Director. Um, Patrick Figuerella, the city, Figuerella, sorry, Patrick, the city engineer <laughs> is also on the line for this item. Um, I'd like to enter file 2020-237 into the record and I will call up the applicant. Mr. Ellish is on the phone, I believe, in his presentation uh, for him to go first. Thank you. Right. Hmm. Good evening, everybody. And Good evening. Uh, thanks for. <clears throat> we also have um, Alan, are you on? It looks like he is, but I don't know that he has um, his microphone on yet. If someone can hook in Alan Hendricks. Alan was going to do the first part of our presentation. There you go. We can't hear you, Alan, for some reason. Yet. Not getting any sound. <clears throat> oh, that might be you. Well, you got Ron, but I don't know where Alan is. There you go. Oh no, that was okay. No, it's it's Ron. We need that. We need Alan. I know. I can see him, but I don't think that we have sound. So let's see if IT can maybe figure out how to get sound in because we do okay. have um, video. While we're trying to get his video, why don't I just do a brief brief introduction? How's that to keep things going? So, um, you know, I did have a chance to, um, our vision, I met a lot of the residents in this uh, whole Lake uh, Ida region and, um, you know, the whole North Swinton area. Um, we had a, 
<clears throat> we also looked at, because there was a previous uh, developer who was looking at this property who was uh, trying to get uh, more zoning. Um, that was turned down. We actually found out about the property, <clears throat> met with staff, met with Patrick, met, met with a number of people in zoning. And what we did is we tried to um, take all the things that were really the vision and the feedback from the original, uh, you know, potential developer. We tried to make it work. Uh, we are zoned for 16 units. We actually ended up with uh, going down to 14. Um, we, we took all the feedback um, from staff and I think we've created a really, uh, really great community. Um, at this point, we have 14 single family homes, Delray Ridge. Um, we have, um, in talking to a lot of the residents, really have uh, gotten feedback to what is uh, people are looking for in the area. Um, by the way, I didn't introduce myself, actually, Ron Ellis. I live in Delray, I'm at 16920 Silver Oak Circle. Um, 33445 and been building in the city since 1979. So we're excited about uh, Delray Ridge, our newest community. Um, <clears throat> what we've done is we've created something very exciting and we have, uh, you know, I, I think what's in front of us today is, you know, we're asking for, I'm not sure if it's the right word, the um, reduction of right-of-way of tangerine so it wouldn't come all the way through and our purpose is in talking to a lot of the residents trying to create a nice passageway between Swinton and Seacrest sort of con going connecting the schools um, I know a lot of people in the Lake Ida area trying to get over to uh, the middle school where all the ball fields are um, you know, something that was important. <clears throat> um, one of the things that's interesting, and I know that, um, you know, staff had some comments, you know, we um, have had some meetings with actually the church next door. And one of the things that we discussed is they have this piece of property that can actually take two lots. <clears throat> but in order to get to two lots, we also realized that both lots would need to face Swinton and nothing could actually fit and face onto Tangerine because it wouldn't match the uh, setbacks or the uh, square footage of the lots. And I think that was maybe one of the concerns that was discussed. Um, the other thing is we're very sensitive to, and I've heard it earlier tonight, but on the north end of our property, we have four really old, beautiful oak trees and by creating our passageway, our, our pedestrian pet, we're able to save those trees. And, you know, we're, you know, we're very sensitive to that. We're, um, you know, not looking to enlarge our property. As I said, we have actually two less units that we're entitled to. Um, we had our traffic uh, report done and not only uh, did obviously we not affect our traffic, but also suggested that uh, a road going through there really wouldn't make sense. So anyway, we, you know, we've talked to the schools, we've talked to the churches, we've talked to the residents, and we're very excited about what we're bringing to uh, the north side of the city. <laughs> as far as the images, if someone can take, go through the slides, you can see them real fast what we're doing. That's our site plan. Um, the green part is uh, the retention area on the right side of where the trees are. You'll see those in a second. You can just go through it, whoever's controlling this. Again, the site plan. <clears throat> We're showing our, um, this will be the pedestrian way with ballers. That's going to be our new entrance. And we're actually going to be able to put uh, gates in there. So that's uh, coming on Swinton. That's what 22nd will look like right there with an exit only onto 22nd. So we're not um, hurting any of the uh, cars that are coming in when the kids 
get out of, um, either uh, going to school or out of school because a lot of the cars park on 22nd. That's a picture of uh, Swinton with our wall and our landscaping. Um, a version of our path, you can see some of the oak trees that we're trying to keep and creating a nice image going through there, a lot of safety and you know, we think it'll be a real advantage tying the Swinton area to Seacrest. Um, this is a plan that was put together north of the, you can see where the church is on the left side, that big piece. And if the church would ever um, redevelop it, you can see that the lots have to face on Swinton. And that's depicted on the right, right picture. Next one. Um, so there's a, a picture of the, in yellow, where the path would be, and you can see the existing oak trees. And if we actually had to widen it, it would all disappear. <clears throat> so that's, that's probably the crux of what we're talking about tonight. This gives you sort of an idea of a streetscape of when we'll be building the homes. It's a combination of what's going on in the area. It's a mixture of transitional homes as well as contemporary homes. We're going to have two models with different elevations. So it'll be look like a real custom community. And then I think you can keep going. There may be a few more. These are some renderings of what the homes will sort of look like. And then we'll have different variation of colors. And uh, this is just some of our preliminary um, renderings of what we're doing. So give you some idea of what we're, what we're looking to do. We're very excited and uh, we know the residents are, and we hope all of you are as well. Did we get uh, any sound um, to Mr. Hendrickson? No, it doesn't look like it. Um, okay, so um, Mr. Eilish, can we move on then to the um, city? Yeah, I think so. I think so, unless okay. anyone has any questions for me. We'll, we'll probably have questions, but we'll have them at the end. You got it. Okay. Okay, sounds good. So let's move on to Anthea. Okay, so I'll give you um, just a brief overview. And, and again, um, Patrick is also on the line uh, for questions related to the technicalities of the of the item. Okay, so we do have a subdivision that is going through the review process right now. Um, so I think we should be a little careful of using words entitled to a certain number of lots. You have to meet all of the specifications set forward. Um, but ultimately what we're looking at is that a request to subdivide four existing lots into 14 um, new lots through a plat and a series of easements. Um, and so this is what is before you now. And, um, you know, typically, um, we would see redevelopment that would want to utilize our existing right of way, and then they would improve it to receive access. In this case, uh, the developer is proposing a gated situation and therefore has defined their own access points, um, which would not be shared by the surrounding um, communities, which is, you know, sort of why I think there's um, some discussion in terms of the ultimate um, right of way for Tangerine Trail. Um, when redevelopment comes in, we typically um, then assess whether it's a house that's being built from scratch, just one house, or an overall subdivision like this one. That is when, um, if there is not um, adequate right of way or there's a need for dedication, um, that is when that requirement is tripped. And the quantity that is related, uh, that is required, is ultimately based on the adopted standards within the comprehensive plan. Um, when we did the always Del Rey plan, the required right of way width for local streets was reduced from 60 feet down to 50 feet so that we could have the smaller neighborhood streets. Um, and then the amount that is required is, is sort of based upon um, somewhat of the geography and the lay of the land. In this case, it's a, kind of an interesting situation because you have a 20 foot platted right of way that does serve 
some existing houses that then becomes sort of an unimproved right of way and then disappears altogether before it makes a connection to Swinton. And so there's two different um, requirements that would come into play adjacent to this property. Um, one related to where there is right of way and it needs to be augmented and the other um, basically where there's no right of way at all and what is needed to make that connection um, at the minimum standards that are adopted um, today. We do have some streets that have narrower rights of way um, that are adopted by code. Most of those are on the barrier island um, and um, you know they're usually one lane roads that are only 30 feet wide. Um, ultimately there's um, other streets on the barrier island are allowed to be 40 feet wide. Alleys, of course, are only 20, um, but um, generally local streets are required to meet a 50 foot right of way. The applicant is proposing um, that in, in lieu of, um, they would dedicate uh, 50 feet along this portion of Tangerine Trail, and then instead of having it go through or proposing to, to meet um, the connection through a 20 foot easement, um, there are some utilities there um, as well that would, would establish the throughway through a pedestrian um, bicycle pedestrian link. Um, so the criteria for a reduction in right of way width is that um, the city engineer has to support the reduction. And if he does not support the reduction, there is an appeal process to the city commission. Um, but in order for him to even be able <laughs> to support the reduction on his own, the development service, the, the development management services group, which is comprised largely of the directors that um, you know you have in the city related to any type of construction, um, utilities, um, public works. Uh, I, I'm on that as well as uh, Steve Tobias as your chief building official, um, and so ultimately that group has to uh, provide a favorable recommendation for um, the city engineer to have the um, power to do the reduction administratively. Um, so here's the considerations. Um, the current Tangerine Trail um, serves three properties as an access road. It actually has paved access. There's the piece on the corner, which also takes access from Seacrest. And there's the this house, um, which is you know the next house in. There's a double lot with the house on it. Now you're moving into sort of an unimproved, non-paved um, portion of Tangerine Trail. There is an existing lot here that is owned you know, on its own. And these are the long pieces that are owned by the church. And so ultimately, you know, just the long-term planning concern, we have seen a couple of churches that have taken pieces and subdivided them off and surplus them. This is a school, it may not ever plan to do this, but you know, if the plot was to go through, then theoretically you may need access um, for, a new plate, for a new lot next to this one. Then this one, of course, would have access from, um, I was say Seacrest. La, la, la. Okay, so things to think about. There are already city water and sewer utility lines within the ultimate right of way. And there are easements as well that are offered in, within those areas to accommodate those. Um, there is no, typically we either need a through lane or some type of way to turn around emergency vehicles. Um, and while that's desirable, the fire uh, department has not indicated that they actually have an objection to this requested reduction although some way to move a truck through in a straight line, whether the uh, surface is reinforced or something would be preferred to not having that option at all. Um, and ultimately, if the right of way itself is not secured now, then there's um, no future connection to Swinton that would be possible um, over time um, to disperse things. Um, so, Again, ultimately requiring the full right of way, and the, de the, the determination, the findings that have to be made is that requiring the full right of way would constitute a hardship in this particular instance. Um, and that the improvements can still be provided in a way that does not endanger public health, safety and welfare. And that there are acceptable provisions that are being made to accommodate the features that would otherwise be accommodated in a standard um, right of way. I did want to voice um, actually confirm some of the things that the applicant stated, which is that the, the major tree stand um, on the site, the most valuable trees are located in the area that they are proposing um, to accommodate differently. I think that's um, important that that is accurate. And then I, I just wanna be sure that 
um, while the images of the gated community had a lot of landscaping, it, it is important that um, you know the required street and pedestrian, um, particularly in an area with a school, are accommodated over time with the with the eventual completion of this flat and this development. It simply can't be a wall with landscaping. We do want to see all of the provisions that the streets require in that area. And I know that's not the topic today, but I had to say it out loud. Um, Patrick, is there anything you would like to add? Um, to the conversation before we turn it over? Well, sure. So essentially, the request is to remove Tangerine Trail from the road network. So a bit, that's the, the long and the short. The, the question is to either have Tangerine Trail as a road, which currently it is shown uh, on a maps as a road, and so um, if the decision is made to uh, accept this request, then Tangerine Trail would essentially forever stop and not go through. So that, that is effectively the request, and that's why this is the commission level action, because removing a road from the network is exactly the thing that commission needs to provide their guidance on. It's not a staff level decision that is for the commission to say, Yes, we think it's appropriate to take this road off or no, let's keep the road. So that is why we are all here tonight, essentially. All right, very good. Um, did we ever get access to um, Mr. Hendricks or no? He's or he's just listening in. I guess he doesn't have the voice. Uh, he doesn't have the, the yeah, hi there. <laughs> All right, so um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to um, uh, break for uh, call-in comments by the public. Uh, we will take a five-minute um, time frame for them to call in on this project, which is 7C Tangerine Trail, and um, it is now 7.13. We'll come back at 7.15.
Beep, beep. Where's my guy? Can you hear me now? We sure can. And it is now 718, so let's come on back. <laughs> Just in the nick of time, Alan. Yeah. In that kind of day. <laughs> Hopefully I did a good job, Alan. We'll see. You did an awesome job. <laughs> Uh, let's see what kind of questions we have. So, okay. Well, first we're yeah. going to go to the um, any comments that came in. So, Ms. Kateri, can you tell us whether or not we received any comments, please? Yes, I do have messages to pipe. Thank you. Hi, Commission, Mrs. Mayor Albert Richwagon. 251 Northeast 17th Street, Delray Beach, Florida, 33444. I'm calling in regards to the road, possible bikeway um, over by Unity School. I think it's a great idea to not make that a roadway. I think we need more parks and more bikeways. There's uh, already a couple of roads that have recently been put through across from the uh, Pomosa School, and uh, it's just being used as a cut through through that neighborhood. Uh, we don't need any additional roads. People know to use the road along the convenience store or to go all the way up to Mission Hill to go through. Um, bikeways are, are an amazing uh, addition and a, a great asset to all communities for kids and for adults alike. Um, I think that we should definitely put that through as a bikeway, pedestrian way, not a roadway. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Uh, yes, my name is Robert Russo, and I reside at 910 North Swinton Avenue uh, in Delray Beach, as I have for the past 50 years. And I'm calling in reference to the uh, Delray Ridge uh, item that uh, is on the agenda. Uh, <clears throat> as I stated, I've lived here for the past 50 years. And I've seen a lot of changes in Delray Beach, most good, some uh, questionable, and some bad. Specifically, I'm referring to the refer referendum to extend Tangerine Trail from Seacrest Boulevard to the North Swinton Avenue extension. Uh, Swinton Avenue is already a traffic obstacle uh, with past decisions to add landscape aisles on the end of each street, blocking easement onto an already oversaturated traffic flow. On the other hand, Seacrest Boulevard has been recently refurbished and is a more direct route for commuting between Boynton and Del Rey. Adding another cut through street to avoid the traffic signal at 22nd and Seacrest makes no sense. Uh, and it also adds to the deluge of traffic on Swinton Avenue. Hence, a passive landscape trail allowing easy and safe access to the residents of Lake Eden and North Lake Ida to the Community Swimming Pool, Lamosa School of the Arts, uh, would resolve multiple issues. I respectfully submit my opinion for your consideration. Let's keep Swinton Avenue historic, not hysteric. Thank you very much. This is Chris Rich calling R-E-I-C-H, 1002 Northeast 9th Avenue, 33483, Delray resident. And I am calling about the agenda for the uh, Delray Ridge. Did I oppose the road extension and in favor of the pathway going through? A number here is 276-4736 at Delray Camera Shop. Thank you.
Yeah, my name is Tim Bogle. I live at 1701 Northeast 2nd Avenue in Delray Beach. And I'm calling about the, the pedestrian pathway. I think we should definitely have a uh, pedestrian pathway all the way through there. And uh, that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Bye. Hello, this is Chris and Peggy Fisher. We're residents at 228 Northeast 17th Street. And I just wanted to reach out to you guys and let you know we are in favor of the bike trail versus the road extension off of Seacrest. Have a good day. Hi, I was sworn in. My name is Michael Mariano. I live at 257 North in Delray at 33444. And I'm calling in regard to the uh, bike path and pedestrian uh, pedestrian walkway in the area of Ridge, Ridge something up here off of Swinton. Um, and I, I am uh, in support of that. Uh, versus uh, the uh, True Street, and uh, I believe that's it. Thank you. Have a good day. Give me just a moment, Mayor. There are a few messages that just came in, so I'm going to switch them over real quick. Give me just a moment. Hello, my name is Charles Whalen, W-H-A-L-E-N. Um, I've been sworn in, and uh, I, I, yes, I do agree to tell uh, the truth. Um, I am responding to uh, agenda item 7C this evening. I'm watching online. Um, I live at 1935 Southwest 35th Avenue in Delray Beach, 33445. That's in the Oakmont neighborhood um, off of Old Germantown Road. I, I own... Uh, the vacant lot on the um, north side on the west end of, of existing Tangerine Trail, where it currently ends. Uh, that is uh, Block C, Lot 7. Um, I've been watching, and I, um, I approve and um, support, agree with uh, the developer's proposal to um, basically block off um, the undeveloped, the non-existing western part of um, uh, Tangerine Trail and his proposal to provide a uh, pedestrian and bicycle walkway on that portion. Um, and I'm okay with uh, giving up, I have to give up an extra five feet of, uh, of right-of-way on, on, on my lot. Um, I think I have a 20-foot right away and, and it's going to go to 25 or 25 to 30. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, and I think the developer has a great, I really like his proposal uh, to block off the, the remainder of the, the non-developed, non-existing portion of uh, Tangerine Trail um, and make that a, uh, a walkway, pedestrian and, and bicycle walkway. I think it's a great idea. So uh, thanks. Thanks for letting me comment. Bye. I do. I am sworn in. My name is Melody Lunsford, L-U-N-S-F-O-R-D. I live at 135 Tangerine Trail. I also have a lot next door to mine. And I am sworn in. Uh, I am calling to let you know that I approve of the walkway. I disapprove of a road going through here because there's a lot of traffic coming out of Tangerine Trail on a daily basis. It's too much. I approve on this development going in, and I like the walkway and the, 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 the trees and everything, but 
but I like the privacy that I've lived in here for 21 years. I've been in Delray for over 60 years. My family's been here, and I just want a quiet neighborhood, and with the schools around, I think it's a good advancement. Thank you very much, but I do not want to lose any of my property because I do have a fire hydrant, I do have a water meter, and I do have... I don't want to lose my property. So thank you very much, and I hope all goes well. Uh, I wish you would notify us in advance. This is the first time I've ever heard of this meeting, so I'm here for you. Thank you very much. Melody Lunsford. Hi, my name is Alex Candia. I reside at 9 Northwest 24th Street in Delray Beach, 33444. I'm calling in regarding resolution number 59-21, and I'm calling uh, with support uh, for the Ron Ellish development to turn Tangerine Trail into a pedestrian path. Um, as a uh, neighboring homeowner, I think this would be um, a benefit to the neighborhood and I look forward to uh, to seeing it pass. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Mayor, that concludes public comment. Very good. So we're going to move back over into um, cross examination. Um, and if there's any cross examination by the um, uh, the uh, applicant, now would be the time. That would be Alan or Ron. No, I, I think we're fine. I uh, um, I think uh, we spelled it out. Alan, I don't know if you have anything more, but I will tell oh. you that all the people who called in, I have no idea who they are, so I want to thank them. <laughs> I have no idea. Any cross-exam? Cross yes, go ahead, Alan. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor and Commissioners and everyone. I'll make this super brief. <clears throat> um, sorry, I couldn't get on earlier. Um, I think Mr. Ellis uh, underestimates what a good job he did of outreach to the community. Um, uh, and I think this has been presented well. Uh, few few items I just want to run through. The, the, the stars have kind of lined up in the, the context of this uh, to where we have an opportunity to create a safe pedestrian pathway from the schools and the churches and the neighborhoods. Uh, I know this is something that uh, Delray Beach wants to um, to promote is a multi-use path, if you will. Uh, and this would be the, the first that I know of that um, that connects this. I believe it's, it's perfectly suited for this because of the context that it's in and the functionality that it can bring. Uh, this has always been a, you know, historically a dead end street. There are other ways to get through. I think that if we did make it go through, it would be a cut through for anybody who was too impatient to wait for the light. So I, I see great opportunity uh, in preserving these trees, just in, in making this part of the neighborhood, a, a friendly part of the neighborhood. And the reason I say the, the context is because there's this uh, parcel and then there's the school board parcel next to it uh, so you only really are servicing about four or five houses uh, the property that is now the churches that is to the north of us uh, I looked at it uh, slide number nine uh, actually is probably the most likely way that that could be developed if it was developed in the future which would mean that the houses uh, the lots would load onto Swinton, which is um, uh, promoted in the code. <sighs> I'm about out of breath. And um, and we're here to answer any further questions. Uh, there was a question about uh, fire well, trucks. We'll get, to, we'll get to the questions um, at the end. This was just basically to um, just any any sort of um, you know cross examination of any of us. So let's let's move on to the um, sure. city staff cross. So I do have one thing that I just want to make abundantly clear is if we are moving Tangerine Trail to bike pedaling, the thing about bike pedaling is they're successful when they connect to other bike ped routes. 
And so another outstanding comment that has not been addressed is that we expect to see sidewalk infrastructure connect to all of this if the roadway, in particular, if the roadway is not done on this side of the street along this development. And I, I just wanted to say that on the record, that, that part of the success if this proposal is granted is that it links to the neighborhood along the other rights of way. And we're not relying on sidewalks that are on the opposite sides of the street for any kids that live on this side that might be going to that school, et cetera. And that's all I'd like to add. Thank you. Very good. Any rebuttal testimony by the um, applicant? Or um, is it, yeah, am I at rebuttal or am I at, uh, yes, rebuttal testimony? Ron or um, Alan, any rebuttal? I believe yeah. that uh, the applicant agrees with that statement. Okay, and uh, any rebuttal for um, Anthea? We good. Okay, to the commission. Uh, Mr. Frankel, um, Deputy Vice Mayor, you had your hand up first and we'll go to Commissioner Bolton. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very persuaded by the uh, numerous public comments and uh, I also appreciate that Anthea brought up that concerned uh, about the sidewalks and connecting and Mr. Hendricks immediately said that will not be an issue and I believe that to be credible. So I am okay with the request tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Boylston. Thank you. First, I, um, I wanna get on, on the record that I did ask for an opinion from uh, Ms. Jellen um, and she received the opinion from the ethics commission because this project could not be any closer to my house. It is literally right across the street. And I wanted to make sure that there were no issues, which there weren't. And, uh, and we got a professional opinion on that. Um, I 100% I agree with staff. I've had a lot of conversations with Anthea and yes, nine out of 10 times we are gonna be in favor. And I think we've shown it uh, as a commission, we're gonna be in favor of the grid system. We're, we're gonna be in favor of alleyways and keeping that connection you know, not only in our downtown, but through our entire city. But one out of 10 of the times, and I think this is a great, really great example, um, there is a reason for an exception. And, uh, and that picture has been, has been painted tonight. Um, and I think it gives us an opportunity to, uh, to explore the power of bikeways and pedways, the way they're used in other communities. They're almost, they're almost used like shortcuts. You see them in other in other cities where you get to take a shortcut that no one else gets to because why? Because you chose not to get in a car. You chose to walk, you chose to bike and uh, and you get access to these little shortcuts or these really um, these really well landscaped areas or old bridges or old highways we've seen in bigger cities. So I think this is gonna be our first opportunity to really explore that. Um, so I am very much in favor of this project. I'm aligned with the surrounding communities and the surrounding schools. And uh, Anthea, thank you for pointing out not once, but twice that we expect a sidewalk down 22nd and Swinton connecting to this new pedestrian um, at bike way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cassell. question because I too I, I'm leaning in favor of this project but once again we see um, in the agenda cover report like I see that the DSMG made a lot of references to the um, mobility portion of the comp plan and you know I can we can look at that one way but I just want to confirm where it talks in the agenda um, page about the concern with respect to utilities uh, in the right of way, and forgive me because I was just reading something else. Uh, it says uh, DSMG expressed concerns related to existing utilities within the ultimate right of way access, et cetera. So, I just could you explain what um, if, if if you have any concerns with respect to the existing utilities? I'm sorry, you're muted, Anthea. Thank you. So I don't know if Patrick can help me out there. Um, they, there are utilities 
and that's one of the many things that rights away do. They they make room for those things that you don't see that we still need. And right. um, the applicant has proposed to um, instead of providing um, the right of way, actually accommodate the room for the existing utilities in an easement. I'm if, I'm not saying this correctly. Either the applicant or Patrick jump in and correct me. <laughs> so that is my understanding that. Um, you know that that would be the way that they would ensure the city has access um, and in terms you know the comp plan is the adopted policies of the city and so i think that i think patrick stated it quite well that if we are going to significantly deviate from what we expect a local street to be like it's it's just something that has to elevate to this board so um there's that too, but we need to make sure that those things are accommodated. Patrick, is there anything related to the utilities that you want to add? I don't know if Asana is on. Sure. Um, the existing utilities uh, that are out there, and there is a sewer main that runs both east on Tangerine Trail and west, the western part of Tangerine Trail, and then through the road alignment that's not there yet. And there's a water main that runs uh, also right through that corridor. And it's currently covered by utility easement. And uh, the addition of the pathway would probably improve the city's access in some respects to the manholes, because right now there's currently, uh, it's currently unimproved over some of that gravity sewer system. And on the flip side, of course, it'll put a hard surface over it, which uh, if they ever have to access that underground, that would have to be dug up and put back in. But on the other side, when you put a hard surface over utilities, that means nobody's likely to stick a shovel in it and break it. So, but the, the utilities are there. They're currently in the easement and access will be maintained with the pathway system. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question about, um, uh, first of all, let me just, um, uh, just make, make a comment because I, I didn't realize that you know, where this property was, but uh, one of the persons that called in was a client. So I think that we had a, a sale there, but there's no, there's no issue with it. It was a long time ago. Leave that, 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 that picture up. Um, the two properties that are um, actually fronting Tangerine that are part of the church's property. So not the one that um, the caller called in on. Yes, those two. Um, mm -hmm. Is there going to be any kind of an issue with them having to reconfigure those to um, change the direction because they will absolutely not be able to access uh, Tangerine. Um, and so that one property is landlocked unless it's flipped or, you know, the line goes the opposite way from the east, um, from the east to the west. So is that posing any issue? So. In its current configuration, the, the property has access. It's, it's just looking to the future if they were going to subdivide. And ultimately, if we make this choice to have a, a distinctly different little right of way here, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to resolve that issue if it presents, if and when it presents itself in terms of the configuration. Um, just trying to think of everybody's. I mean, right now this is the school and it is, there's no application that's in to change that. They've given us no indication that things are changing. We're just looking at sort of the natural flat line that might go through. Um, but like I said, it may end up that it can only be one lot or it would be a, a layout similar to what the applicant has presented and we would have to uh, take access then from Swinton um, if this is approved, so. Well, maybe it's a question for Lynn, um, just, you know, from the standpoint of just making sure that we're not going to end up in a, you know, a legal situation because we've changed access to a lot that now has to go towards um, Swinton. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here because I know that we're not going to have that as a, um, a road. And I, and I actually, I support the, 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 the path versus the road, but I'm just, looking at this and saying, is this something that would potentially um, create an issue for the city? That's all. I don't think so. It's, is, is it one okay. of the undeveloped ones? Yeah, but there's two under, well, it, it, you can only see the tail end of it. The first one is that it attaches church, the one that's in from that, 
the second one in uh, from um, Swinton, that one. That's the one that I'm most concerned about because if it was left as it stands, there is no access road to that particular property. Whereas it was expected to be have the access to uh, Tangerine. Do you see what I'm saying? I do, but it's, okay. they can rely on an expectation that someday the road would be there. So I, I don't think it's an issue. Okay, very good. Um, and I, you know, my 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 concern was also to that that third property and that third property that was the uh, gentleman that called and said that he was 100% for it. So uh, that that eliminated any concerns that I had. I, I think it's a great idea and I love the idea that basically it'll be a lower volume uh, road slash pathway to get people safely to um, you know, from from Swinton to Seacrest instead of going uh, northeast 22nd. I used to live right off of northeast 22nd off of Fourth, and I know that that's a very, very heavily traveled area between Seacrest and Swinton and it is just the opposite of being safe. So this really gives a great opportunity for the community to be able to transverse, um, not on in cars, but in a, you know a bike or pedestrian uh, safely. So I, I support it. All right, um, uh, Commissioner Bolson, you still have your hand up. Are you wanting to speak or no? Okay, um, we can move to a a motion. If any if motion to approve fifty nine dash twenty one. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. All right, great. Congratulations, guys. Sorry we didn't get to hear from you, Alan, but uh, I'm sure there'll be other times. <laughs> no Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, moving on to 7D ratification of emergency regulations. This is pretty standard now. <laughs> These are just our usuals. Yeah. Anybody want motion to motion to approve? Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel. We lost. Ms. Oh. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. And yes. Yeah. Um, All right, Mr. Frankel, Mr. Nope. Frankel had to leave. Um, that's why you oh, don't okay. see him anymore. Oh, I thought maybe he thought it was over. I don't know. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right, so moving on, we don't have any public hearings. We're moving on to 7A. These are the, this is going to be some first um, readings. And uh, this is kind of the first time that we're doing this. So it's going to be interesting to see how this turns out. But anyway, going on to ordinance number 09-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, adopting a small scale land use map amendment for parcels of land located at 215 Southeast 1st Avenue, 219 Southeast 1st Avenue, 223 Southeast 1st Avenue, 227 Southeast 1st Avenue, 231 Southeast 1st Avenue, 237 Southeast 1st Avenue, 243 South Southeast 1st Avenue, 251 Southeast 1st Avenue, and 253 Southeast 1st Avenue, which measure approximately point 1.41 plus or minus acres as more particularly described herein redesignating said land from medium density md to commercial core cc pursuant to the provisions of the community planning act florida statute section 163.3187 providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause providing an effective date and for other purposes and just a reminder there's no presentation on this today um, it's just a matter of if the commission wants to discuss and deciding if you want to move this to second reading Okay, so to the commission. Open for discussion. I mean, Steve. Yeah, I'm happy to move it to to second reading. Okay, so you have you are saying to move it to the second reading, um, yes. Mr. Bolton, yes. And vice mayor. Second. second. Yes. Okay, so so we'll we'll do it the way we always we'll do. It. Sure. Move it to the second reading. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm sorry, Lynn. Does that is it a motion to approve? Yes. I, yes. Okay. Got it. Got it. I, I didn't know if the the verbiage had. Motion to approve ordinance number 09-21. Got it. Motion to approve ordinance 09-21. Second. 
Okay, so any discussion? Does anybody want to discuss? I, I, I personally, I, I'm not going to support, but I, I think I'm going to be outvoted. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. uh, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? No. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? And no. Um, move, and I think that, is it just, uh, it's one that needs to be moved on, is that correct, Lynn? No, so essentially the motion fails, um, so this item would not move to second reading unless somebody wanted to amend their motion. We, it's a tie, so when we have a tie, the motion fails. So, if any. Okay, moving on to uh, number 9, eight, uh, Item 9B, ordinance number 10-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, rezoning and redesignating land zoned medium density residential RM to Central Business District CBD for nine parcels of land located at 215 Southeast First Avenue, 219 Southeast First Avenue, 223 Southeast First Avenue, 227 Southeast First Avenue, 231 Southeast First Avenue, 237 Southeast First Avenue, 243 Southeast First Avenue, 251 Southeast First Avenue, and 253 Southeast First Avenue, which measure approximately 1.41 plus or minus acres, is more particularly described herein, amending City of Delray Beach zoning map June 29, 2017, and further amending figure 4.4.13-7 Railroad Corridor Subdistrict Regulating Plan and Regulating Map in Section 4.4.13 Central Business District, CBD, of the Land Development Regulations, providing a complex clause and a separability clause, providing an effective date and for other purposes. All right, so any uh, discussion? Just to be clear, this yeah. is this is just to move forward to the second reading, which then the presentation would occur, right? That's the new format? Correct. Okay, all right. So voting no on this is that you don't even, not even interested in seeing a presentation about it. Correct. Wow, okay. Um, oh, and and is, is the, is 10, um, 20, one affected by what just happened with 1020 technically 1021 should be denied only because it's it it goes along with the previous so legally, motion to deny ordinance 1021 i need a second i'm sorry could you just clarify he's saying can you give a second and then we'll see the second, and then, we'll second and then we can discuss just make a second and then we'll discuss Second for discussion. Okay, go right ahead, Ms. Patel. Just to clarify, we denied, we voted 2 2 on 9A. So 9B being connected to it, we, we would automatically, would, so we have to just say that we're denying, uh, not, we are voting no on 9B as well. Legally, it has to, to be denied. Legally, it has to be denied. I'm sorry. Legally, it has to be denied because they go together. So you can't have one without the other. Okay, got it. And then what happens? I mean, now they don't have any option to, I'm, I'm just curious procedurally, since this is the first time we're doing this, if you could just clarify for me. Typically we would have our first reading and the next time we'd have a presentation. We voted no on B, so presumably there will be, I'm sorry, on uh, excuse me, A, so yes. presumably there will so, be no presentation. Correct, so so, so the, the point of this was in order to, number one, not have to have two presentations on the same subject matter. Basically right. you voted up or you voted down. If it's something that you're interested in, you would like a presentation, you would vote to move it forward to second reading. If it's something that, you know, based on your discussions with staff, the applicant, or your reading of the ordinance, if it's not something that you can support, you can vote no. But essentially the vote on the last item, because it failed 2-2, two, two, it's over. So, I mean, as somebody, I presumably could re move for reconsideration at the next meeting, but at this point, there's um, there's th this one, ordinance 1021, it's, it's, it's dead in the water Connected. because the other one was denied. Right. Understood. Okay, so I believe um, the motion was to deny uh, 90 ordinance uh, 1021, correct? That's correct. It's on the, on the floor. Uh, call the roll, please. 
Mr. Bolson? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. 9C, ordinance number 11-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 2, Administrative Provisions of the Land Development Regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, by amending Article 2.2, Establishment of Boards Having Responsibilities for Land Development Regulations, Section 2.2.5, Public Art Advisory Board, Subsection D, Duties, Powers, and Responsibilities, to amend the duties of the board to include review and make recommendation re regarding public art and the public right-of-way on city-owned property, and on structures in the public right away and make recommendations to the city commission regarding public art installation, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, authority to codify and providing an effective date. This also is first reading. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ordinance number 04-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, rezoning the HHH Bush Building Special Activities District SAD to the 1177 Modern Special Activities SAD for the property is more particularly described herein, repealing ordinance numbers 38-84, 39-90, and 01-11 in their entirety. Amending the Land Development Regulations of the Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4, .4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.25, Special Activities District, SAD, Subsection 4.4.25H, SADS, to add 1177 Modern, said land generally located north of George Bush Boulevard between the Intracoastal Waterway and Andrews Avenue, as more particularly described herein. Amending the City of Delray Beach, Zoning map, June 29, 2017, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause, providing an effective date and for other purposes. This one is second reading. I believe the applicant's attorney is um, present. Very good. And that would be um, Mr. Bernardo. There he is. Good, good evening. That's me. Uh, hopefully I should be available. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Thank you. This is second reading. My name's Christopher Bernard on behalf of the, uh, of the applicant. Uh, this was presented on first reading uh, without, it's coming before you on a second reading without changes. The uh, matter did pass first reading uh, unanimously and also did pass planning and zoning prior to that uh, unanimously. So uh, this presentation, I do do have a summary and, and uh, uh, a, our, of our first presentation and, and, and mainly want to summarize that offer uh, that we presented, if I could, a little bit about the site. Uh, this is 177 George Bush Boulevard, it's approximately 1.4 acres. This lot is just east of the intercoastal waterway currently uh, zoned special activities district it is a transitional mixed use designation uh, and what we are before you today uh, is seeking the modification of the current development standards of that special activities district that does apply only to this site uh, the special activities district that's approved approved is to is proposed is to allow for a more appropriate best use for the for the uh, location. Uh, next next slide, please. So I'll give you a little background about the site. This was the location of the HHH building, which had been at that location for uh, over 55 years. And at the time, it was the only five story structure on George Bush Boulevard. It was approximately a 30,000 square foot office building uh, of general and professional offices. Um, in 1984, this was uh, zoned, rezoned as a special activities district uh, with a limited commercial use. And for that time period, it was also authorized for the RM10 residential multifamily district. However, from about 1984 to just recently before the building was raised, 
this was a very limited uh, and underutilized uh, commercial commercial building. In 2011, it was modified to allow a single residence at the fifth floor of the building. So the current allowable uses does permit one residence of 5,000 square of just under 5,000 square feet. Uh, next next slide, please. This shape is unique in both uh, size and shape to just about everything in the vicinity. Uh, the, as we see, it's a, it's a triangular shape, three boundary lines to the north, south, and west. It's got over 577 feet of frontage along the northeast, southwest curvature of George Bush Boulevard, and approximately 200 feet of uh, depth at the western boundary and comes to a point of zero depth at the eastern boundary. Next, next slide, please. What's in the vicinity? We are surrounded by medium density, residential, multifamily districts in, in all directions of the SAD, uh, the Special Activities District. Uh, the current district, as you can see on the map, uh, the zoning map, it is by purple in the middle, other than the neighboring um, uh, limited uh, residential office and to the, to the, uh, to the north, uh, east, is a limited permissible commercial use. And currently, uh, the the permissive per permissive use is underutilized and out of character with with everything in the in the vicinity. Up until its raising, the building was also under occupied, uh, sensing the the uh, misuse of the of the of the lot with only a single pharmacy tenant in in an unknown period of time before the uh, raising of the building. Uh, next slide, please. What's around our lot? We are surrounded by again multifamily various heights, uh, various types of uh, multifamily residential condominium buildings and over uh, six in the immediate vicinity and, and others in the surrounding areas, a conservation area to the to the south. Next slide, please. So what do the current development standards do? They allow very limited and inappropriate commercial use of this lot. It's non-conforming to the surrounding residential multifamily community, it's underutilized, it's inappropriate for the land use, and it prevents very minimal green space. Uh, the traffic flow is higher, uh, and again, it's what what a main concern to this uh, to both the zoning uh, and the and the commission. It's non-conforming to the city's comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. So, what were we what are we proposing? Oh, I'm sorry. Back one. What, what are we proposing today? We are proposing a modification of those development standards of the special activities district to allow the development of a unique three story residential condominium that's going to contain a private club, thermal suite, dog park and other amenities available to the residents. It's proposed modification of the development standards are to conform to the surrounding community and there is no change necessary or appropriate to the actual special activities district activities district zoning designation. Next slide. This is 1177 modern. It is the plan development of the site. These are actual renderings of the plan uh, plans and specifications that has just been before SPRAB and did pass SPRAB as well. Uh, you are looking at a bearing northwest from George Bush Boulevard. Again, it's a three story residential condominium building, 16 residential units, each unit about 2,200 square feet under air. Uh, the lot coverage is less than 40%, and we, we plan to increase the green space, green space of, the, of the lot to over 25%. Uh, we are also reducing the height from the current five story HHH building of over 48 foot feet of permissive height to the new standard of 39 feet, uh, which we are proposing in the modification. Uh, next, next slide, please. This is Bering South 1177 Modern. Again, a unique club with a spa thermal suite, which is going to be housed in a detached single story structure. Uh, it will have a pool, fitness center, dog park, pavilions available for the residents use. Next slide. The density of 12 units per acre is in conformity with the neighboring residential district. We are not asking for an increase in density that matches the current uh, used density on the site. 
The setbacks of 15 feet along the perimeter and 50 feet from the center line of George Bush Boulevard. We are also reducing the parking available. Currently, we have a 90 parking spot parking space limitation. We will reduce this to a 45 parking space uh, spaces at the structure of the floor. Uh, first floor. Uh, the site is elegantly landscaped, which was presented to the uh, to SPRAB uh, just just within the last two weeks uh, with various uh, various landscaping through an, an, an intricate landscaping throughout the site. And again, we are increasing the green space to over 25% of the, on the on the on the parcel. Next slide, please. You're looking at the master development plan for 1177 Modern uh, George Bush Boulevard on the bottom of the screen. Again, the dog park you'll see will be up up to the uh, east point end of the property. Your structure along uh, uh, per per perpendicular. Uh, uh, congruent with uh, with George Bush Boulevard, you see the parking underneath the pool to the to the north north end. Next next slide, please. So, what are we proposing in the new development standards? Again, we're pr proposing the permitted use of a three-story, 16-unit residential condominium, private club with spa, thermal suite, pool, fitness center, dog park, and pavilions available to the residents of the development. Our density will stay at the current maximum of 12 units per acre. The site is 1.39 acres. Setbacks will be 15 feet along George Bush Boulevard and the perimeter 50, 50 feet from the center line of George Bush. The maximum building height uh, will be 39 feet, again, reduced from the existing allowance of 48 feet, which was present during of the five story building uh, of the HHH building. Lot coverage area will be a maximum of 40%, which includes any buildings, pavement, hardscape, site improvements of the property. The open space minimum will be at least 25% of the total district, including the perimeter landscaped boundary, which will be an open space. And the structure size, any freestanding structures will have a minimum floor area, floor area of 400 square feet, which will be architecturally consistent with other structures in the development plan. And except as to those provisions, the development standards shall apply as, a, as applied in the 4.4.25 and 4.34, which is in essence the multifamily RM residential zoning district. Uh, next, next slide, please. Mr. Bernardo, are you wrapping it up? Because it's almost 10 minutes. I am. I am. So I don't have to go through the support uh, our, our, at our first reading. That summarizes the project. Um, but we can quickly, quickly th go through these slides, which shows the mu multiple. Um, how we do conform to the to the uh, comprehensive plan uh, as we are meeting the housing needs and all of those provisions we did go through on our first first reading. Um, again, the more appropriate use if we stop at that site, more appropriate for the site, a unique development pattern and, and distinctive uses. We are meeting each of those requirements, which are findings that the commission is charged to find today. Uh, next slide. So additional findings, again, we do want to mention, we did mention the, the significant reduction in traffic performance, uh, solid waste uh, will be decreased, so cool capacity will be matched with a impact fee of a very small increase, and drainage will actually meet the 10 year and 24 hour criteria. Uh, next slide. So we would uh, again propose the approval at second reading of our project 1177 modern and the uh, modification of those development plans um, for the special activities district to allow the permitted uses at this site thank you thank you so much okay so um to the commission no mayor um mayor oh. public hearing is it public hearing? I, I didn't think that we. Yes, this is second hearing. reading. You didn't see it's not on the agenda, but it's second reading. So, oh, all right. Um, yeah, I do apologize for that. This is a public hearing. I did want to just add one slide to the mix, if I could. Okay. And um, I just, I do want. It is a public hearing because this is considered a rezoning. This isn't just we're changing the land development regulations to an SAD. This is a whole new rezoning, which is why it doesn't need to be open to the public for comment. Um, the only thing I will add is that at the first reading, I think basically the analysis is related to whether or not um, SAD was appropriate for condominium development as opposed to using RM with increased setbacks. 
Um, the Planning and Zoning Board had recommended unanimous approval with the reduction of the height. The ordinance before you and the applicant have supported and adjusted the request to reflect that reduction in height to 39 feet. Um, in between first reading, which there was a unanimous approval, um, and this reading is when an SAD, because it's a complete rezoning, because there is a new development that's being proposed with its own new rules, went to Sprout on March 24th and it received a recommendation of approval five to zero. And so the SAD is in order now for your consideration tonight. And that concludes my presentation um, and that's it, thank you. All right, very good. So what we're gonna do is give ourselves um, a five minute uh, break in order to be able to allow for anybody who wants to speak to this um, particular agenda item, uh, the opportunity to calling in. So it is now 8.09, we'll come back at 8.14.
Okay, everyone. I think it's time. Ms. Kateri, did we get any uh, comments? No, we did not. Okay. So to the commission. Motion to approve. <laughs> Second. Second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Thank you so much, Christopher. Have a great afternoon or evening. Thank you very much, Commission. Thank you, Mayor. You got it. All right, moving on to 10B Ordinance 05 21. This is also a second read. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development and regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 4 Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4 .4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.13 Central Business CBD District, Subsection 4.4.13 I2J CBD Parking Standards, Minimum Number of Off-Street Parking Spaces to Extend the Effective Date to December 31st, 2024, Providing a Conflicts Clause, a Severability Clause, Authority to Codify, and Providing an Effective Date. And I believe that is the wrong, is that, is that? Oh, I'm sorry, that's correct. This one is second reading as well. And I don't believe there were any changes made between first and second reading. Okay, very good. So Mr. Schiller. Sorry, uh, Mayor Commissioners, I was having some technical difficulties. I apologize. No problem. Good evening. I know it's been a long one. I'm going to go through this very fast. This is Ordinance 05-21. Uh, again, as you remember from our last uh, meeting a month ago, uh, we are ex all we're doing is expanding uh, the parking exemption for an additional three years and a few months to December 31st, 2027. Uh, uh, or 2024, excuse me. Uh, the program would end April 4th, uh, or actually without amendment, it would have already ended. Uh, however, we're hoping that you will continue to approve this program, planning and zoning, and the Parking and Management Advisory Board both unanimously uh, approved the extension request. Next slide. Very, very briefly, I don't want to take up additional time. Again, this is the language. Uh, this literally uh, is between Southeast 2nd Street and Southeast 3rd Street. Um, again, this was established back in uh, 2018 to, or, uh, yeah, 2018 to provide incentives for commercial property owners to redevelop and reuse their properties. Uh, as you know, parking, uh, land for parking is expensive and scarce, particularly in this area. Next slide. This is the portion of the railroad corridor subdistrict, the applicable area. This only affects 13 properties. Next slide. These are just some photos. Again, this is the same presentation that you've seen previously on uh, looking north on Southeast 2nd and south on Southeast 2nd and then north and south on Southeast 3rd Avenue. Next slide. Uh, as you may remember, there is some new parking that's going into the area, 61 new parking spaces. Uh, next slide. Again, uh, 61 new spaces with nine new streetlights, uh, improved landscaping, and uh, the applicant and the city are uh, working together uh, to not only uh, enforce the parking restrictions there as the city and the applicant have a uh, agreement as you've uh, approved previously and the developer will maintain the parking lot. Next slide. Next slide. This is just a rendering of what the new parking area would look like. And again, this has already been approved. Uh, we are, uh, I think, a week away from getting our building permit. Next slide. This is the proposed language. The green underline is the only thing that changes. And really, the only thing that changes is the, the 2021 to 2024. Next slide. We're in compliance with the comprehensive plan. There are a whole bunch of different policies and objectives there. Next slide. 
We're also compliant with the Osceola Park Redevelopment Plan, uh, both strategies 2.4 and uh, 5.7. Next slide. And in conclusion, again, we are recommended approval by Planning and Zoning and Parking Management Advisory Board. We've been supported by the Osceola Park Neighborhood Association. Uh, we're consistent with the Comprehensive Plan, Osceola Park Neighborhood Redevelopment Plan uh, update and the LDRs. Uh, all this does is extend the existing program for another three years and a few months to make it end on December 31st, 2024. This only affects 13 properties and provides for some economic uh, development in this area of the, of the, uh, of the city and uh, happy to answer any questions. All right, Anthea. Um, there have been no changes between first and second reading, so I have nothing to add to this. Um, it is um, second reading of an LDR text amendment, though, and, and we should go to a public hearing um, situation yep. as well. Thank you. Okay, very good. I was confused because there's zero under public hearing, and then we've got this <laughs> 10, which is not normal for me. So anyway. Um, right. no I, Lynn and I actually said something to each other, and we still didn't. It was. Uh, it's yeah. my fault. It, it wasn't tagged properly in Legister, so I apologize. Not a problem, Thank not you. A problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to take five minutes to allow for the public to respond if they'd like to. It is currently 8.23. We'll come back at 8.28. Okay, we're set. Apparently, this is.
Oh no. All right, everyone. Coming back. Any uh, comments or calling from uh, the public, uh, Ms. Kateri? No comments at all. Okay, very good. So moving to the commission. Motion to approve. We have a second. second. Very good. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Moving on to 10C Ordinance 12 21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 96, Fire Safety and Emergency Services of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, by amending Section 96.02, Fire Safety Inspections provide additional right. methods of collecting payment and imposing interest for delinquent fire safety inspection charges, providing a conflicts clause, a separability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and further purposes. And this to a second reading. Do you see Paul, Cliff, Rose, and Mobile? Chief Tommy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can someone mute yeah. him? <laughs> Come on. I will make this quick. This is just a, an ordinance, a men's ordinance to provide us for collecting payment on our fire inspections. Currently, we don't have anything for that and it mimics the same thing we do for EMS billing. Okay, is this also um, a public hearing? Yes, okay. So um, anything that the uh, city would like to add? That was a city. That was the city, I'm sorry. I'm so tired, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and give ourselves another five minutes in order to allow for the public to be able to respond if they'd like to. Uh, it is now 8.30, we'll come back at 8.35.
All right, everyone, it's 8.35. Anybody call in, Ms. Kateri? No, we did not get any. Okay, very good. So this goes to the commission. Any comments, concerns? Motion to approve. Okay. There you go. Second. All right. Uh, I think Mr. Boylston's still out, so let's give him a sec. Oh, okay. Well. Is he coming back? We have a quorum. We can proceed. <laughs> Call the roll. Ms. Johnson? You. Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. And Mr. Boylston's here. And Mr. Boylston, I'm sorry. Yes. All right, very good. Um, long evening for a first time back. Um, here we go to comments and inquiries on uh, non agenda items. We'll start with city manager. Jennifer, anything? I have um, I have a couple of items. They, they should be relatively quick. Um, the first is, I don't know how if you can hear me OK, but the first is in person um, commission meetings. I wanted to um, ascertain if we had consensus to go ahead and move forward with meeting back in person at the next regularly beginning with the next regularly scheduled commission meeting. I believe that's on um, the 20th. So if I could, if if, the, if you would like to discuss, we would put all of our COVID protocols in place um, the way we've done it in, on on a few occasions when the commission has met in person. In addition to those protocols, one of the things um, I did discuss with our IT director would be um, not doing a hybrid. So either you're all in person, um, but being able to maintain that telephone line to allow the public to call in and leave public comments. Um, that way the, the public still could participate and leave comments um, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, We've done that as well during the commission swearing in ceremony. So if that works for the commission, I would just like to see if everybody's okay with proceeding in that fashion and we'll ramp up for the 20th. I'm good, with, got, that. I'm good with it. Good. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah. Um, um, really quick, Jen. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask Anthea if she had anything noticed. Um, because if she had notices that went out that were for virtual for April 20th, um, that could be a problem. Why don't Anthea? we just plan on doing it the first meeting in March? I mean, in May, why don't we just do it that way? So you don't even have to worry about it. We can just say the month of uh, May we're starting back. I think okay. that would work if, if we were to have any yeah. um, situation, I'll, I'll advise the commission. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Lynn, for that. Um, and then I just wanted to commend um, particularly our Parks and Rec Department. Um, they had such a fun and fabulous Easter egg distribution uh, event, and they've just done such a great job at reimagining some of these events during this COVID um, phase and, and having to be distant. So I just wanted to commend the Parks and Rec Department for all their work on that. It was just super and so well received. Lots of positive feedback. Those are my items. I do know that there has, you know, at the beginning of the meeting, there were some questions. So uh, if there's some specific questions that the commission wanted to bring forward regarding Sunday Village, I'm happy to answer those, um, or I could just wait till the, the commissioners um, provide their comments. At your pleasure, Madam Mayor. Um, I would say just let, I guess, the commission bring it up. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, Len? Nothing. <laughs> okay, and so we have um, Julie Cassell followed by Vice Mayor Shirley Johnson and then uh, Commissioner Boylston. Julie, you're first. Great. Um, super quick. I just have four hopefully quick things. I'm looking for a consensus. Um, you know, I've appeared in front of us and talked about the shocking statistics relating to um, plastics in our oceans. The Coastal Star featured a gentleman, and I think Mayor you might have actually mentioned this at some point somewhere. Uh, his name is Andy Abbott, and his organization is called the Be Beach Bucket Foundation. Right. So Mr. Abbott designs and installs custom beach cleanup stations. I just printed this out, and I'm holding it up for everybody to see. 
Um, and basically, um, he's, he makes, he designs these, um, these, uh, things, I don't even know what I want to call them, but with durable material, puts them together, and then they're placed on beaches. They cost generally about $1,000, and Hal Stern of the Green Board and the BPOA reached out to Mr. Abbott to ask him, would this be something he could do on our beach? He came, he walked the beach. He says that he thinks five units on our beach would be perfect. Um, so I'm looking up for a consensus to move forward with the purchase of five of these stations. And they contain these plastic buckets and then a disposal area. And the buckets have um, QR codes, which would give information about the plastics in the ocean. We should, we, we could, uh, you know, make the uh, information specific to our beach. We can have anything we want and that. And so it sort of serves as a great way to educate um, our visitors and also to enlist them to help clean up our beaches. And so, um, and the BPO is willing to partner with this uh, on an ongoing basis because not only is there the upfront cost we'd incur, which would be about $5,000, but there is maintenance in terms of, you know, cleaning up the plastic debris that's disposed of in the container. So um, I'd like a consensus, if I may. So I, I think this is, this is probably a good time, and I'm, I, I love this idea. I think it's I think it's great. But this is probably a good time to bring up something I was discussing with staff. There's a procedure in how these things have to be done. Um, I noticed, Ms. Casal, you you posted in regards to getting consensus to implement a coastal habitat converse, um, conservation plan. That's not how it actually works. Like staff is still going to have to find money for that plan, have that discussion. And then it is going to have to come back in front of us to vote on. We can't just well, throw things. Expensive. I don't. Is that you're saying that you have a problem with that statement? Miss Miss Al, Miss Alvarez, can can you just explain how this process works? That it isn't just bring up anything to spend money and get consensus. It has to be consensus to be put on an agenda. Right. But we did get consensus to do that because you were one of the people. Oh no, I'm sorry, you didn't. Excuse me, I apologize. The mayor and and no, uh, Ms. Johnson. I did. I I I'm in favor, and but what I said was I'm in favor of hearing more from staff, as in when it's put on an agenda. Um, so you you, you, you stated to I the you stated to the public. Just one moment. You you stated to the public you received a consensus to implement a coastal habitat concept, and you you haven't. You you've. You've get well, it now has to come back to us. That's actually what I asked for. Okay, I well, uh, Miss Miss Alvarez, okay. can you just please explain why that's not uh, proper procedure and what actually has to happen for something like that to move forward? When when um when we're discussing items to move forward that may not be necessarily in the budget, right? Um, my recommendation would be if if. We have a discussion like we're having at the moment at the end of the meeting and we get consensus. I, um, whatever that consensus is, gives us the signal as staff to go ahead and start developing what's going on to then bring it back for commission approval. And that's what I would recommend, especially if there is something that's being uh, requested that may not be necessarily in our current budget. Um, because obviously we have, we have the marching orders for the commission on anything that is budgeted because that happens during the budget process. But if it were to be something that would require expenditure of funds that we'd need to find an appropriate way to do so, my recommendation, Commissioner Cassell, so in this instance, if you, get, if you receive consensus to proceed, what I would then do is work with staff to bring about, uh, you know, and, and obviously the attorney's office to bring about a method by which we can purchase and install these containers, so to speak, um, and get that approval at the commission and, and put that up, cue it up for the commission's discussion at that point. So the terminology work. is that I should say, I received consensus to proceed. Okay, I'll make sure to do that in the future. Thank you. So let me also ask back. another question. Do we have a consensus before we move forward though, to proceed? Um, I say Thank yes. You. I mean, we, we need- I'm very to, we excited need... about that. Um, so I will on bring the back, that back I... at a future agenda. 
That's correct. And so on the back side of that, just, just so I uh, understand this, because it, it's important that we don't just um, decide to go with something without actually going through a bid process, too. I mean, I think that there is a process that's involved in uh, making sure that we're not, um, you know, just giving someone business without having to go through that process. And I, and I don't know, this could be something that's very unique and there is no you know, whatever, but we have to find that out too so we don't find ourselves in a situation like that. So, and I've asked him to provide us um, documentation, actually, excuse me, I should say Hal has asked him to provide us documentation and I will provide that to the city for our future agenda. Okay. That's how that, yes, okay. thank you, Madam Mayor. We'll do our due diligence on that front as well. Absolutely. You got it. Yes, Ms. Uh, Johnson, real quick. Um, she, I know that Julie yes. is still in the middle of her discussion, but if you have something to add. No, that's okay. I Go ahead, to, Ms. Johnson. I want you to comment on on this conversation i'll get sure. in on the conversation anyway i feel that in order to be fair to everyone uh commissioner cassell still working her way into uh how this works took me a little while too i think we need to also revisit your program because i really didn't get to understand it i wanted you consensus give you consensus to go back to the city manager and have them do the research about the program because I have found out sometimes these programs are not free and if it's not in the budget well, we should not, not be it's not free. but, it's but not we don't free. want to discuss it tonight I I'm just asking I, that you would go back to the city well, manager because we meeting, we've had a meeting and we have another scheduled but I will be happy to notify all of you I'm very excited and I'll be thrilled to notify you as we proceed. Okay, so 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 you did get into the getting back to the city manager, and we will be hearing about that program you talked yeah. about. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and just just thank you, thank you. Uh, just as a comment, I think that's a little pricey, unless <clears throat> excuse me, unless this material, and we're going to find that out, is made out of uh, some precious wood. I I well, I'm going to quit my job and start making them. I, so no, I understand what you're saying and they're made individually and they're going to be made with a more durable product and the BPOA is wanting to share in this process with us. So I think we can figure it out. Yeah, because that's an important uh, element, especially with the, con the dune conservation or plan. You know, I did some research on that afterwards and yeah, a plan may, you know, cost twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000. I can't remember what the number is that you shared. Uh, but I, I did research in regards to implementing a plan like that. And there's a reason why counties usually implement plans like that and not cities, because it could easily add six figures annually moving forward to actually implement the plan that you would adopt. So I really want to make sure that we're diving in, that our staff is doing plenty of research and that we're, we're not getting consensus to move forward on something that could be a six figure line item every year to the taxpayers without actually having a discussion. So I just wanted to clarify that. No, I agree with you and I appreciate that input. I've only had one meeting and I'm scheduled for another one this week. So thank you. Very good. Anything else? Thank you. Oh, oh yeah, I didn't finish. I apologize, allow right. me please. Um, so Barkingham, Palace, I think we've all heard from Barkingham Palace, the owner, Mr. Maturo, and his uh, representative, Matt. I spoke to Attorney Jellin about this, and I guess I'm wondering, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Attorney Jellin, uh, you did say that we could give him some kind of conditional use. Is that correct? No. <laughs> Sorry. No. So it, Barkingham Palace, and frankly, Beach Dog, for that matter, are not operating um, under the conditions of their approval. Um, Barkingham Palace is scheduled to go to code board, I believe this week. Um, Beach Dog has not been cited yet. Um, okay. They can either, um, you know, uh, prepare a privately initiated text amendment to the LDRs, okay. um, or if it's the direction and the consensus of this board, um, you can direct staff to prepare, to prepare that. So, um, our recommendation, we have had extensive meetings about this, is that if it is something that the commission wants to consider, um, you know, it should be done as a conditional use. It should be like, just like tonight with the gas station where you can actually consider the actual parcel, the actual project and any conditions to mitigate the impacts as opposed to having, um, giving something by right. 
if that is a direction, um, any matters that are pending before the code board would be stayed um, pending um, resolution of that. So we wouldn't punish them, you know, while the commission is considering whether or not to move forward with the text amendment. So oh, if I may just um, to my fellow commissioners and mayor, the thing about this is I think he's been in business for 15 years and I spoke to the gentleman and I'm wondering, he believes he was able, if you go back and look at his website, even his um, sign off on his emails, it says we board, we do this, we do that. So I'm not certain if he was misunderstood or what have you, but it concerns me when someone in business 15 years says this could potentially put me out of business. So I'm wondering if under these circumstances, we should try and consider doing something. And so uh, that's, I'm just asking. Can I, can, I just, can I say something really quick? Um, and, and this is with respect to all of you. I think we have to be really, really careful about our purview. So something that goes before the code enforcement board will never come before this commission. Any appeals of code enforcement matters go directly to circuit court. So I think we need to be mindful because number one, your board members watch you and they're listening to what you're saying. And we would never want to give any type of influence to those board members and an unfair advantage really to the applicant because city staff does have its own position. You know, we don't typically bring these things to you because they're not within your purview. It's not something that you're going to consider. The text amendment is a separate issue. But I think we really have to be careful because we're we're finding these instances where people are reaching out directly to you as commissioners and, and it's putting you in a really bad position. And I can tell you that I've had conversations with people and really urged them to leave you out of it. Not because you don't care, but because I don't want to put you as a policymaker in a position where it's uncomfortable and where somebody might get the wrong impression. Because what happens at code board, they cannot appeal it to you. And so I think we need to be really mindful of that. If the commission wants to direct staff to um, issue to prepare a text amendment, you direct us if there's consensus, if there's a majority, we move forward. But as far as you know, deciding whether or not something is credible or not credible, I really would urge you to just be really, really mindful and step away from that because we don't want to create an unfair impression on somebody for something that is not within your jurisdiction. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Boylston. And uh, Commissioner Cassell, I, and that's exactly the same conversations that you're having with individual businesses um, or a business is what sparked my conversation with staff. And that conversation was our population is growing. The trend of dog ownership is growing faster than the population is growing. So dog, dog population is growing faster than human population coming to our city. Um, and we are very limited on where these services that are needed for this growing population are allowed. So rather than come at it, coming at it from an angle of these specific businesses reaching out to us, I think we do have to look at those services being provided to our population, our growing human and dog population, and uh, in, in, in address and address that appropriately. And that's why I would be in favor of looking at a tax amendment that would allow the services to be allowed in areas where they are needed in our city. Right. And I would um, I would also just like to add very um, briefly that um, I think it needs to be um, on a conditional use basis because what, right. what's happening in one section of our town may not work in another section. And I'm talking about even in the same area. So if we did do this, um, there are uh, some of those, uh, a place that might abut to a community of residents, and when dogs are left in uh, a, a strange place and embark all night, that can actually disturb the peace for those that are living close by. So I think that we need to be very careful about what we're doing moving forward, but I would also support the same thing as my two colleagues just brought up. I would. Yep. Thank you. I think you have your consent. Okay, and then I guess the last item is, is uh, you know, the trees um, and so we got a number of calls and you know I basically stated my position in the beginning so I guess um, could we discuss or what are does the um, Commission have the option to impose a penalty aside from going to the magistrate what is it that we can do as a Commission in these instances where people show little regard for um, the agreement they make with the city. 
So um, to answer your question, no, the commission does not. The, again, that's a code enforcement matter. So anytime that there's an alleged violation of a site plan approval, you this commission gave the site plan approvals. Somebody potentially may have violated those approvals. Those go to the special magistrate, the code board for their consideration. Um, we did change our ordinances and they are the board. The magistrate is able to imp impose what are called enhanced fines, which is up to $15,000 per violation. So we have done, um, you know, a significant amount of work, especially with historic properties. And I will say I, I do take exception to the comment that was almost criticizing staff. You know, staff can only do so much, right? You know, we have a limited, a finite number of employees that can only do so much. And, you know, frankly, we can't stand at a job site and make sure that everything is being done. You know, the Rudolph house is a perfect example. One day the walls were up, one day they were gone and staff had zero knowledge. So I think it's really unfair to blame staff. And, and I'm not saying that this commission did that, but I'm saying this more for the public, you know, to blame staff and say that we're not doing our jobs. We can only do so much. We have to have an element of trust with the developers that they're actually going to do what they promised you they're going to do in order to obtain those approvals. And so with with this Sunday Village property, I think we're going to take a, a very cautious approach. So I understand the public outcry. I understand the urgency of the situation, but I think staff has to be very methodical because we would never want to accuse somebody of violating a site plan approval without having the requisite proof and, and be, being able to support that. So I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I spoke to Ms. Alvarez and Anthea about this today, but we're really taking a very measured approach to this because we don't want to create a situation where accusations are flying and we're bringing somebody to the magistrate and then we get there and then we find out something that may or may not affect the outcome of the case. That is not to say that the city is not taking this seriously. That is not to say that we may or may not take action. But as we stand here today, we are still looking at the situation holistically. We're looking at the approvals. I can tell you that this project is going to come before you again. The approvals that were given several years ago, they're not consistent with somebody who being able to even develop the property according to our rules. And that's through no open fault on here. It's just that's how that's how the approvals were done. It was a late meeting. And so that's going to come before you. So and I'm going to say this too. Um, we have to be careful with the things that we say because we never want to give the appearance that we're not being fair. You are these are quasi judicial proceedings, so there is an element of fairness. You are the judges, so we have to be careful with the comments. Right now, it's an allegation. There's an allegation that somebody did not comply with their site plan approvals. Now, staff is working to potentially build up a case or not. Um, we will update you. We will let you know what we're doing. We are taking it very seriously because we know that this is an important piece of property to this community and it means a lot to every one of you as well. But at this point in time, there isn't anything that this commission can do and staff is is working in order to make sure that if something is going to be brought before the special and it will go before a special magistrate who is available on Friday if we need him, that we do have all our ducks in a row and all our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted because the worst thing would be to be, bring somebody to, to to code with a violation that we're not able to prove. Can I ask a question on the same uh, property? Um, we have historic homes over there that um, I'm getting reports that are being allowed to um, decay and uh, will end up being demolished by neglect. Um, is there um, any is there any code enforcement checking on what's going on? These are these are special, if not more so, than the, the trees that were removed and clear cut. So I'm just wondering, are we going to end up with just an entirely vacant property that, you know, doesn't really have any semblance of what it was supposed to have to begin with? Uh, we actually did get an update this evening on that. Code is aware of it. They are working closely with development services. You know, Michelle Hoyland, you know, and Anthea went yesterday and counted trees. They went on a golf cart to count trees. So this is something that your staff understands the importance of, and we're looking at it. You know, the, the tricky part of code enforcement, and what people don't really understand is, unfortunately, code enforcement doesn't have the same rights that a law enforcement officer has. And even though these properties are so significant and important, unfortunately, the law doesn't really see it that way. So we can't just, you know, go into these houses to see what the damage is inside. You know, you can see so much outside, and I have seen photos that are alarming, 
And I know that code is going to be looking into that and potentially preparing a violation if it's warranted. But, you know, we can't just go inside a house and, and check to see that it is being maintained. The code enforcement officers don't have those liberties, those rights, and rightfully so, right? I mean, it's not, this is your private property and nobody should be able to enter ex absent exigent circumstances or a warrant or something like that. So while I appreciate the, the passion, we also have to balance that with the law and what the law permits. And so, you know, staff is doing their best they are reporting to Ms. Alvarez, who is reporting to you, and these aren't things that we're taking lightly, but we are going to be very, very measured in how we handle it. Did that answer your question, Commissioner Casal? Yes, thank you so much. And I guess I'll just throw out there that perhaps, you know, we should consider a tree overlay in some of the areas where we do have trees like this that we consider very valuable and in, in need of protection um and maybe that would prevent this in the future so i'm well, not sure if anybody's willing to consider that i, I yeah i'm gonna jump on that i'm, I'm not gonna discuss that specific property because staff asked me not to in my meetings preparing for tonight um and thank you miss jellen for that guidance but what I think we're finding is that the steep penalties, financial penalties that we have put in place, which I think ours are the steepest in the county, by the way, is working because our, our, our tree fund is ballooning. However, it's not accomplishing what we wanted it to accomplish. Right. The developers are willing to write these huge, huge checks. There's a project coming down the road that I, I believe will put a million dollars alone into the fund that is already almost at a million dollars. There's $2 million worth of trees. I really do think, um, Commissioner Casal, that we need to pivot this plan. We need to talk about how do we incentivize saving larger trees. And I get it. I, I've met with Community Greening. I've, I've met with our green implementation board, some of their members. When you have a choice, you have fifty thousand dollars, and you have the choice of buying one mature hundred-year-old tree or five hundred saplings. Well, guess what? Our tree fund is significant now. We don't we don't have to choose, and we can decide what the penalty is to incentivize developers to save mature trees and not just dump money, more money into this tree fund. So it's working. What we all put in place, it's working. But it's also not working and I would love to get a workshop it doesn't have to be today it doesn't have to be tomorrow, but I would love to get a workshop in the future where we can discuss it and go okay it's working it's not working, what do we change. Did I hear uh, Commissioner Boylston say workshop. <laughs> he did. He did. <laughs> All right, anything more to record that for prosperity prosperity workshop any anything more Julie. No, thank you all. Okay, very good. Vice Mayor? Thank you very much, Mayor. I'm going to be as quick as, as I can because the hour is getting later. My first thing was loud and clear. I hope the community is listening because they are clearly upset about the very item we were just discussing. And I feel that this issue must be addressed in the very near future, i.e. at a workshop. Uh, that was my first item. The second item is I'd like to thank everyone who participated in the March 27th COVID-19 community event because it was most successful. I don't know if I can quote the number and if it's wrong, please forgive me. Um, I believe we dispensed 630 J&J uh, &J vaccines, which means 630 persons, people, uh, received a vaccine and they did a once and done. They don't have to do it twice. Yay for you. I tell you, <laughs> I don't want to say who got it and who didn't get it, but the mayor just put up her hand. I'd also like to thank um, right off the top um, uh, Chief Javaro Sims and the Delray Beach Police Department for their law and order and keeping it uh, because people get a little emotional. They wanted that shot, and if they weren't on the list, some of them were very, very upset. I'd also like to thank the family of the Mount Olive Baptist Church 
and the, uh, I guess it's the state, county, public health department, and their efficient uh, medical staff. And I'd also like to thank the Florida National Guard out of Live Oak, Florida. Hard to believe they were sent to really put a cap on it that there will be no disruption or rushing everybody law and order. So thank you one and all. For those of you who received the shot, we'd love to do it again. Write your governor, call your governor, say Delray Beach is the place I want to get whatever they're going to send us. That's number two. Number three, with this, I'm sorry, I have a number two. I'd like to have an update on the city manager search. Uh, I had a brief discussion with the ICM and because of the uh, election and everything else and trying to get ourselves back onto what we're doing, uh, the fireman's contract, everything. I think we need to really, really get ourselves positioned to do what we must do. So however we're gonna do that, I'd like to uh, re uh, address it next opportunity. Number three, Maybe we can have, I think this we can have that addressed at the next meeting, um, Miss. Uh, I mean, at the next meeting, just give us an update. And I'm talking about like the the workshop meeting, so we don't have to wait another extra week. Very, very good. good. Very good. I, I I I'm anxious to see who put their hat in the ring. Uh, number three, it's with a sad heart that I announce the passing of a longtime Delray Beach resident, my neighbor, uh, one of those uh, women who um, is just the backbone of our community. And when I say that, she was never a complainer. She took whatever came her way and always had a good word for everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. If I could be half as diligent and per, um, long suffering as Mrs. Leela Bridges, I would go a long way in my life. Uh, she, I don't know, started declining, 94 years old, been in Delray since the late 1940s. So uh, Godspeed, Mrs. Bridges. And also, I don't know if you have heard that uh, we lost our representative, Elsie Hastings. He passed today. Uh, representative Hastings and I were born 10 years apart to this day. We have a lot in common. I'd like to think I'm passionate and that I'm a warrior, which is what he was. I patterned my life after him as much as I could. He served the state of Florida, Palm Beach County, and Delray Beach. And for those of you who did not know it, I physically am sitting, I think the mayor more than I am, physically sitting where, Ms., where Representative Hastings used to have an office. So we're doubly blessed that he would come in and out of our hall. Um, I dearly miss both of them. So I thank you one and all. I love the new uh, format, uh, Attorney Jellin. I'm getting accustomed to it and I'm hoping that the public will also. Thank you very much and everyone have a good evening. Thank you so much. Commissioner Boston. Well, my entire list has been checked off on in, in Ms. Johnson. I I appreciate, <laughs> I I really appreciate those, those kind words. Well, I'm gonna add something to your list, Mayor. Uh, the Strom family reached out to me in regards to getting their proclamation uh, framed, and I forwarded it to Dolores. Dolores then just dropped this off with my mail, but I'm just a you know lowly old commissioner. So I think I'm going to give this to you to deliver to the Strom family. Um, okay, so let me ask the question, Commissioner, because um, when I was in the office, we gave them a framed copy when they came in. Um, remember the, um, we had a uh, presentation and I didn't think that the, the uh, family was gonna be here, but I had a framed copy. And then I was shocked because I went into the other room to read the read it and and there was a family member there that we handed it off to. So I'm not sure if they requested a second one, but absolutely we'll get it to them. Oh, okay, okay. Or I don't know if I this is- I just wasn't sure blessed. what happened there. I thought, <laughs> well, I, I was surprised. Like, did they give it back? <laughs> And then, right. oh, I, I, I'd like to intercede here. I was told that there was a walk, Mr. Zach's walk, at the first yes. of the month of March, yes. and that yes. Commissioner Boylston was going to give it to them at the Libby Wesley Park. So, how many times? I'm yeah. not sure. Maybe that's where, maybe that's where we got our uh, crossing happening, but we'll get, so. we'll get it. We'll get it. Yeah, I, I was actually out of town for the walk, unfortunately. Um, yeah. 
And so the only other thing is I, I just want to let all of you know that I'm really looking forward to our two day workshop and all of us bringing ideas to the table. And one of them that I got a phone call about today from our school board member, Dr. Deborah Robinson, she is uh, hoping to receive, you know, an update. I said she's got to wait a few more months on a, uh, a field that hopefully will house both um, Village Academy uh, football team and the Delray Rocks. There's been a lot of talks about adding a, a field to the to the, uh, the the Southwest neighborhood and giving both those programs a shared field, which would be which would be huge. So I'm I'm hoping to bring that up as as well as I'm sure many other topics that you'll be bringing to the table in our two day workshop. Are you talking about the two day um, uh, goal study meeting or are we goal having set, yeah. Work? Okay, goals you and workshop. You got it. I'm sorry. You're, the you're goals stuck goals. on that workshop thing now. It's your, now, your, now I'm hooked. It's vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Is that it? All right, very quickly, I just wanted to go over a couple of things. Um, and I wanted to make sure that uh, we also reached out, or we said some positive things about Parks and Rec. They actually did a great job in. Um, uh, helping us to put together, or I should say, helping um, uh, Atlantic High School put together the first Vietnam Veterans Day um, in our park at, v at, at Veterans Park. And that was uh, really uh, a, a, a nice event. It was very quiet, very, um, you know, small, uh, very small attendance, which is what we wanted because of this time of year. But hopefully next year, our second annual will be much uh, bigger. And I think it's really important that we start um, you know, looking at the, the that that group of um, veterans, they they haven't gotten a lot of uh, you know um, acknowledgement for uh, just being the Vietnam veterans. So we have a Vietnam Veterans Day now, which is the 29th of March. Um, second thing, also that that the uh, Parks and Rec and uh, and others, including our police department, were involved in was the uh, ribbon cutting of our uh, Seacrest uh, Avenue, and I got to ride bikes with uh, with uh, Commissioner Boylston and his family, his two girls. Um, in a tandem bike going down Seacrest, it was really wonderful. And I just wanted to say, uh, I thought that that was just a wonderful way to be able to bring attention to um, the uh, bike paths along that road um, as, as we were escorted in by uh, police officers. Now, I have been accused that I have my own, uh, you know, uh, security detail and that they closed the roads down because I was riding a bike through the road. Uh, I, I made sure that people understood they would have done that regardless as to whether or not I showed up. Um, that was something that was pre-planned in order to be able to make sure that uh, the staff, anybody who was riding it, it was going to be safe going from one um, spot to another. And that's an important thing when you're talking about a city that's sponsoring something because we want to make sure that we're not going to um, have somebody get um, hurt and then have that fall back on the city. So it's just the right, it's the right thing to do. And it also was a good thing for, for bringing attention. And then, um, let me see here. You talked about the vaccines. You talked about the historic uh, property over there. Um, there was a, some, a comment that was made. I brought it up with the city uh, manager, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody also heard about this. It was, we have a lot of uh, construction going on, especially on the islands. The streets are very narrow over there. We've got people that are parking on the left and on the right and all over, and it's very difficult if someone's trying to get an emergency vehicle down to one end of the road, you can't do it, there's no way. Um, so what somebody had suggested, they brought me over to their house, that we um, develop a, a plan, and I asked um, Lynn to look into what, or get us maybe some copies of what they're doing in, I think it was Gulfstream. Some, some other city has an actual construction manual so that there is a requirement that if you're if you're doing construction, you're only parking on one side of the street. So that allows for everybody to be able to get down that street, uh, emergency vehicles or anybody else is trying to get home instead of weaving in and out um, through through the street in between the trucks and and uh, all the vehicles that come because of building and construction. So I thought that was really a smart idea and passed it on, and we'll probably maybe see some of that. And then finally, I, I'm just going to say something very briefly about the. Um, the uh, Highland Beach contract, because none of you, I know that um, Adam might have been maybe one year, but nobody else on this commission, nobody that I'm seeing here in front of me had the experience of going through what we went through the last time. This is not new um, as far as um, a contract or a negotiation with Highland Beach. And um, where we came from, guys, it's very important to understand, was um, the city was more than supplementing, this was back before we did the this contract that we have right now, more than supplementing 
um, you know, the, the Highland Beach Fire Department. And what we did was we just came up with a, um, a contract that was really a cost contract. And um, that was important because, you know, the city of Delray Beach residents should not be, not be um, in a position where we're actually subsidizing another firehouse or another fire department. Now, there's a lot of sides to this. It's not as easy as just putting it out there that, you know, they want less money. Um, but that is the case. That's what's happening and it's what happened um, before. What we have to recognize is this. If you're going to be part of our team, our, our group, um, and, and, and our, you know, firehouses, you got you to gotta do what we're doing. We can't make differences. We can't, like, allow you to have less people on your, um, uh, you know, fire engines um, than we are, and you become a, a more of a, a, you know, substandard part of ours. So that was the, the thing that I wanted to make sure that everybody here understood, that we need to support what we have passed, which is that we want three members on a truck, and we can't make an exception um, to uh, Highland Beach. Highland Beach does not want to pay for that third person on the truck. You know, I didn't either. But you know what? The commission decided that that's what we're going to do, and it's a higher level of, of, of service, and that's okay. But we can't now allow for somebody else not to do that. And we also should, should be very cognizant of the fact that when you're part of this bigger organization, we offer a terrific, a, a tremendous amount of, of services that you can't do when you're a very small organization. And so it's, it's really up to them, but it's also up to us, but it's, you know, to decide that we don't want to give anything less as far as the service of ours to them. And if they're not willing to pay for that service and being part of this bigger organization, that's their prerogative. But I think that what we need to make sure of is that we're not, as a city, subsidizing um, and allowing them to have a, a service that's different or that we're paying for part of their service. Those are the two things that I wanted to make very clear. And I did that with, um, you know, uh, we had a great conversation, Mayor uh, Hillman and myself, about where we stand because I think that I get totally what he's saying, but I also understand where we are. And that's, that's what he's got to understand, that we can't do two different things. So anyway, that's what I'm going to leave it with. And um, we'll have that conversation when it comes up. And uh, everybody, it's great to be back and um, together again. We've got a few more years, and uh, you all have a great evening. It's late enough, so I'm going to go ahead and gavel it down. Mayor, 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 oh. Mayor, yes. Mayor, before yes. you, I always yes. do this to you. I apologize. Hello. I wanted to give a shout out to the Parks and Rec for the um, tremendous work that they did to make sure there were enough tables and chairs at the COVID vaccine. They got Can I tell early. you, they, they have just been the heroes. They have been the heroes this last month for Delray Beach. So yes, absolutely. Yes. Shout out to the Parks and Rec again.